It's good to be the king. <laughs> Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the John and Pete Show. I'm proud to say with us tonight for our inaugural voyage, platinum producer and uh, all-around country gentleman. Yeah. The How great James you? Early. Happy yeah. to be here, guys. Thank you so much. Show. Man, yes. Awesome. The pre-show was awesome. The pre-show consisted of us hanging out with James, talking about uh, the state of affairs while we get this thing launched. Just to start off, a little something to our band leader, Corey Jacobs. Our very first guest was, if you grew up in Vallejo, California, we knew that James Early was super bad. <laughs> super bad. And, and, and your reputation preceded you. But uh, the funny thing is, when I finally met you, I had an amount of reverence for your reputation uh, because of all the great things that you've done. And so for our listeners to get familiar, you are responsible for something in the neighborhood of 50 million records. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. How many? 50 million records being wow. sold to the general public. Approximately mid-20 million being uh, your work with MC Hammer. Yes, yes, 20 absolutely. Million. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, I'm shocked myself. I have to pinch myself sometimes, but it's great. I'm honored and really happy to know. But uh, thankfully, we didn't really even get to know that the sales were building up that fast because we were on tour at the time. We're busy. So we didn't know. I mean, we would be out on the road and they would say, hey, you, you your, your song is like half a million. And then it seemed like uh, only a couple of weeks later, it was at a million. And then it just kept growing and growing. Our sales would go up. And so we were blessed and, and working, thankfully working so much, we didn't really have time to, to count the seconds and it all seemed to happen really fast for us. So as you're hearing your chart results and, and the record's doing better and doing better, you are having to worry about tomorrow night's show, mm -hmm. tonight's show, whatever it is, you're worrying in real time about the work that you're doing right at that moment. So it's not something that you could just sit and digest. Wow, look at all these records we're selling because, hey, the yeah. bus is leaving in 10 minutes. Right. And I loved it. I loved it because of that. And, I, you know, the pressure. I learned that I work best under pressure. It's very weird, you know. Uh, but I really enjoy being under a lot of, even today, uh, a lot of, uh, I guess I'm a multitasker because I really appreciate having to have deadlines and get things done. I think I do my best work under those circumstances, but yeah, we were in the studio simultaneously preparing for a tour, traveling by plane and by bus and, uh, everything else you can imagine. And, and, and plus uh, doing television appearances as well. So, so we let's give there. our listeners a macro level, um, uh, uh, view of your contribution. We were talking about Hammer. You were er, uh, in early on within Vogue. Uh, you've worked with the likes of BNGB, uh, New Kids on the Block. Uh, mm -hmm. Who else? Give us uh, give us some uh, names of the folks that you've encountered along uh, along your journey. I really enjoyed working alongside of E Forty um, and and the entire Click family. Um, you know, E Forty, uh, Be Legit. Uh, D shot and sugar tea. Uh, first time they went in the studio ever was with me. Wow. And, um, you know, to this day we're their family yeah. and I'm family to them or, you know, we, we, we hug when we see each other. Sure. And, uh, you know, it's great. And they, they you know, I'm Everybody really, really hugs when they see James early. Man. I'm really, really proud of all of them, including hammer. I mean, because we were all kids when this began right. and we didn't know what was going to happen. Right. We were young, scared, all of us, uh, young guys and gals, not knowing what was going to happen and for it to have it blossom into what it's become is uh, I just even today, as I said, I have to pinch myself because it's like, wow, I can't believe that this really happened. I, I'm humble and I always have been. And I think that's part of my nature. But it's important to be that, too. It keeps you from losing yourself. It is part of your nature. You yeah. are yeah. humble. But, but let's not forget like you've worked with Mark Wahlberg, Sly Stallone, David Bowie. I mean, I've not said a, a tiny person at all in that entire thing but you've also worked with a lot of brand new artists yeah who yeah. whose careers you guided i mean all of those people with the exception of of guys like david bowie are people whose careers you guided from the beginning like you said the first time the click went into the studio the first right. time earl stevens stepped to a microphone 
was in your tutelage. And and I can attest to the fact that there was a time in Vallejo, which has always been an incubator of music, Mm -hmm. in the late 80s, early 90s, where if you were a young recording artist, the best thing that you could do was meet James Early. (laughs) And we all, you know, we all knew it. And like I said, your reputation preceded you. And tell us, your first record with Hammer was Hammer's first first full-fledged album, right? Absolutely. So... Even before that success, though, the the whole town knew you as an amazing bass player. Mm-hmm. So we've looked at the macro, but let's let's start from the beginning. You didn't grow up here in the Bay Area. You grew up in Los Angeles. Is that well, right? actually, I, I did grow up here in the Bay. It was, I was born in Oakland. Um, Oakland is my hometown, but um, raised in Richmond, Vallejo, Oakland, Berkeley, just all over, really. Okay. Um, going to school in all of those cities and um, just I'll go back. Um, What happened is because Vallejo, Vallejo's always been home and that's my connection to Vallejo is it's always been my real home because my grandmother and grandfather are from here and uh, they worked at Mare Island forever. Okay. And so they raised my mother here and um, you know, as a child, for vacations, Christmas, Thanksgiving, summers, we would always come to grandma's house. It was the the hub. And so Vallejo was always special to me. But uh, ultimately, uh, we lived in o- Oakland and then, like I said, moved around to different places in the Bay. And uh, my mother got into um, being an actress. She became an actress when I was a child. Okay. And so I was like, wow, she's doing, you know, TV commercials, modeling, all of this stuff. Your mother has a very, very polished presence. Yeah. She's, she's the queen. She just amazes me. She's my original music teacher and all Mm -hmm. of these things. But yeah, when I was a kid, she got, you know, after teaching me instruments, just by playing them in front of me, she got uh, very early in my life. She became an actress and, and began working a lot in San Francisco. A lot of uh, television work, uh, movies, TV commercials, modeling, print ad, all that. She was doing it and was very successful. And then I, um, she, I, at some point, I would come with her to the set. My younger sibling, Jacques, would come, and as well as my as well as my older brother and sister would come. And so we were all at the set sometimes, just hanging out with my mom. And as eventually, the agents saw us. They were like, "Oh, this is your family. They're, you know, you're a beautiful lady, and you, your kids are kind of, you know." good looking I you know what I mean I guess we we look like cute kids so they invited us to do some work as well and so we started working as well we started doing television and print ad all that as well and uh again I'm like five six years old doing this and just like whoa this is trippy this is classic James early humility is, because you are <laughs> right. uh approaching 50 yeah, I'm you're a good looking man. I'm trying to be. He's there. like, oh, I guess we were cute kids. You got a nice guess. looking family. Well, man. you know, it, it blessed, but you know, it's still humble, man. But we enjoyed it. We were we were hanging out, and I was intrigued by it. You know, just I've always been a technical person, even as a child. So I was like, wow, look at these cameras and lights and action. This is kind of cool. And so we just got into it. So anyway, what happened is we were doing our thing, and then. And working a lot. I mean, I was missing a lot of school in a good way. It was great because you could get out of school and be on a film set and then come back and tell your teacher and your class. And they were like, whoa, you, you were know, out because you, you were working. Yeah, you weren't ditching. You weren't sick. You were you actually were, in real school. You were doing yeah, yeah. In life school, you know, doing some stuff. And then also you're going to see what I did on TV. So it was like we were already superstars in school. It was great. And so anyway, we we got so busy. My mom was working. She did all the Dirty Harry films with uh, Clint Eastwood and, and uh, uh, just a ton of other stuff. And by then, it was kind of like people were telling us, you need to move to L.A. There's so much work out there. Okay. Right? You guys will do great out there. So we were like, okay. So we packed up, moved to L.A., and I, I wound up growing up in Los Angeles. So I'm... So how old were you when I'm you all moved over. south? Um we, I was probably about nine or ten years old. No when we kidding. Moved to Southern California. Okay, yeah, for wow. the work. Sure. We didn't really want to leave. We loved the Bay. Yeah. Right. But again, it was about we could find more work. So we moved to L.A. and we wound up doing the same thing a lot more. And Jacques really started doing a lot of work. My right. younger brother, and um, it was great just growing up in Los Angeles because we wound up going to school with. Um, you, you know, you, we're riding the school bus or riding the city bus, but we're actually running into famous people all the time or right. or you're going to school with the child of a famous person right. 
or even a person that would be famous one day and you didn't know. Sure. Right. This is your bro or your, just some girl you know that's really cool and all of a sudden she, she's a star. And so yeah. it, it happened a lot. And so anyway, for my years in school in L.A., I, uh, I'm still coming back to Vallejo, though, in the summer times. You know right. what I mean? Holidays. We're coming up still to see home. Grandma. It's, it's right. home. But back down to L.A. and This As really I, plays into how your personality in Vallejo got so big because I remember <laughs> knowing if you are a young musician, man, James Early, yeah. everything was James Early. And this was before you really, mm. the success we know you for now really broke. Yeah. But yeah. to our generation and, and until now, I really didn't understand completely why, aside from the fact that you are, a, at the time, we knew you as a, just a smoking bad bass player. <laughs> We, uh, your your cult of personality grew because of all of this, really. I think so. I, I but I didn't know it at the time. But I'm just living and, and soaking up what I could get. And I'm in Los Angeles. And right about that time, when I'm in high school now, I started to Fairfax pull back. High. Fairfax High School in Hollywood. And I start to pull back from the acting thing because I'm just having so much fun in high school and just being a kid and also getting into music heavily. I kind of got tired of the cattle calls sure. and, and the film stuff. I did. I mean, I saw that you could go one way with that, but I said, ah, I kind of just want to be a kid. I really did. I, I'd already spent a good six, seven, eight years or or more paying uh, into that craft. Yeah. Yeah. And, and decided to pull back, you know, I continue to act, but I just pulled back. My mother was still acting as well. But anyway, uh, this band from Vallejo though, Confunction. I'm hearing about them, and I'm yeah. like, "Oh, this is a great band, funky band, great songs." And right. they're from Vallejo, young guys. I was like, "Oh my god, from Vallejo!" And at that time, nobody in LA knew where knew Vallejo, where Vallejo was. even existed. It, 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 you sure. wouldn't even find it on the map if you were trying to to save your life. So I'm hearing about it. And I'm intrigued about this group, but I hadn't met any of the members. I didn't know, even though Vallejo's a small town, I didn't know anyone that knew anyone from Confunction. Wow. So I'm just a fan So in this Los is Angeles. the late 70s, yeah. approaching 1980, around there. Right. And they're, 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 at the, they're at their peak already, having great success. They're actually selling gold albums right. after gold albums and even platinum. And so at that time, like I said, I'm really getting serious about my music. So I started to get into some garage bands. I'm jamming with other kids and stuff like that and going to school and uh, you know, I'll just tell you this. I'm I'm at Fairfax High School, and um, I'm in I'm in the orchestra, the orchestra band. You know, I'm I'm actually playing snare drum and reading music, looking at it. Okay, and then also uh, I played uh, upright bass. I would switch back and forth, and I remember bringing my bass guitar in there. But of course, I wasn't playing that in the band. It was right. it was upright bass. But I would have it, and then after class, I would go outside. And just you know, pull out my guitar. You know, the chicks loved it. And riff, right? And ri I'm riffing. You know, I'm just sitting there. I'm not even plugged in. And chicks are like, "Ooh, look at James. Look he's you know, he's kind of hot." I'm like, "Yeah, it was up." So, but <laughs> you but doing, baby? yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing my thing. But there was some phenomenal musicians there. But there were also some people that weren't yet phenomenal. And I remember one of my um, band colleagues. I'm talking about an orchestra band. Um, a cat that was playing cornet, and I remember him. Um, I remember just seeing him in my mind. I could see it. His name is Michael Bowsery. Yeah. He would come up to me and say, whoa, man, that's so cool. How do you do that? Because I'm slapping. I'm doing the slap thing on the bass. Right. And I'm like, it's so easy to me. Even then, it was easy to do. And he's, just, I'm just like, I'm just, it's like percussion on the on the guitar, you know. But you're, you're you're hitting the strings and making a sound. He's like, well, let me check that out. How do you do it? And I showed him. And then, you know, long story short, Michael yeah. Bowsery went on to become Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> and I'm like, I love that story. I love and, look that this, story. and look at this guy. I mean, he's so phenomenal. Yeah, there was a band called Anthem at Fairfax, uh -huh. and these guys were an awesome rock band already. Flea wasn't yet in the band. He wanted to be, but okay. they had a bass player. He right. just would hang out with them. But Anthony Kiedis was in the band and a bunch of other guys, and they were phenomenal. And I remember um, uh, Michael Bowser, he, was, he would hang out with them, and then eventually their bass player quit, and then he joined the band. I'll never forget when he joined the band because the sound kind of changed, and he was like trying it to— It got funkier. It got funkier almost yeah. right away. And then they just occurred, of course, after school, after they graduated, man, right. just went on to mega, mega fame. Look right. at those guys. Yeah. Can't be a bigger band. That's huge. And, yeah. and, and, the, and the staying power, yeah. too, of the Chili Peppers. They just went into it as because when you know when they first they first hit it they were the young band that was just kind of unruly mm, yeah. and they were playing you know all the sh shows where the skaters would hang out yeah and and they were they were unruly 
Yes. And look at him now. Yeah. Look at him now. And then, you know, kudos to those guys. But another another famous rocker also came up with us, and I got to tell the short story for that. He was a kid that I met actually when he was in junior high. I met him because our drummer in our band was still in junior high, the the, the garage band that I had, uh-huh. my circle of friends. What was again. the name of that band? Ah, we had a couple of different names. We okay. went. Uh, we started off as Mercury Mercury, and then we switched it to class with a K. That was our thing. Okay, right. and we uh, we were a good band. There was a couple of good bands there, but we that was our deal. And we were and our, anyway, our drummer he was in the ninth grade, and then at that time ninth grade was still middle school. Right, and so he's you know got this phenomenal guitar. We wanted a, a rock guitar player in the band that we had, and we you know didn't really have that at Fairfax. We you know everybody was already taken. Okay. But there was this kid that was 15. His name was Saul Hudson, phenomenal guitarist. And we wow. were just like when I when I heard him, I was like, "Wow, this guy is like a child prodigy. It's just yeah. crazy. He had the long hair. He was a cool dude, riffing and he would just he was thrashing but in a cool way. He trained in blues, but he was into rock. So right. he was able to use the blues scales and just do all a lot more than most we're doing especially at 15 years old just phenomenal and so he joined our band and played with us for at least a couple of years Here it comes. and it was just yeah. and i was at the time playing guitar in that band i wasn't playing bass because we had another cat that he was in our circle he played bass too and okay. i was like and we didn't have a guitar player at the time even before saul had came so you so were filling in i played guitar the need we had a bass player but we wanted the rock edge, like I said, and yeah. with with Saul, we with with Saul, we had that. He came into the band, and so now we had two guitars uh-huh. and a bass and drums, and we were a cool looking band. We were rocking out; it was great. And so, anyway, I'll never forget one day this kid Saul comes up to us all and says, um, "You know, hey dudes, uh, I don't want you to call me Saul anymore." And already uh-huh. we're like. Is this a I mean, joke? You're in the ninth grade. I'm waiting. Yeah. What do you want us to call yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting for the punchline, you know. And he's like, uh, well, uh, I want you to call me uh, Slash. <laughs> and we're like, what? <laughs> it was it was hilarious. We, right. <laughs> I, it was, we belly laughed in front of this yeah. guy. He was our bro, though. We weren't really yeah. laughing at him, but it was just funny to hear a friend like introduce his nickname right. and expect you and to just... And he was done with yeah. his old name. He was absolutely done with it. The name was, his mama gave him. He was serious. Yeah, yeah, I just want you to call me Slash. And it was just so funny because it was just abstract and random. But anyway, we uh, respected him. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, look who's laughing now, though. Right, this yeah. guy. Now. Slash. I want you to call me Slash. And did these leather pants make my ass look big? <laughs> <laughs> did these leather pants make my afro look big? He, yeah. he was always so cool, though. He had groupies then it was funny he I walked bet. around well, he's such a unique looking chicks. cat yeah. to say that that was coupled with already developing chops in the ninth grade phenomenal yeah. he really i mean to me he played better than because he there was nothing in the way of he was just into guitar right and he was well studied i mean this guy was showing me licks and i was older than him by a year or so but he was phenomenal and so anyway we, we stayed a band we had some success locally we made our noise and certainly got our girlfriends and all that stuff right but after graduation you know guys kind of go their separate ways yeah no big deal and i wound up leaving los angeles and moving back to the bay when i got up to the bay uh, I'm still in touch with my friends from L.A., but I'm living my life and trying to, you know, make my way. And eventually I got into uh, Solano College up here. Right. Solano Junior College. And I'm going there. And I remember um, one of my friends from L.A. called me and said, hey, hey, James, man, turn on MTV right now. I was like, what? I mean, he sounded like something was wrong. I'm like, everything OK? He's like, no, just turn the TV on turn now. On. Yeah. I turned it on. He's like look who's playing the guitar. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's Saul Hudson yeah, right. in a band called Guns N' Roses. Yeah. And they just had that mega fame. And just, the rest was history because that, oh my that God. was it. Yeah. The there was no sl- slow, uh, uh, slow building up of his career. No, right yeah. away, just bam. And so for me, that these were huge turning points for me because when I saw my dear friend and colleague go from just being a high school kid yeah. to being this world star really fast – uh, you know, with um, Welcome to the Jungle and all those hits that they had, I was just like, wow, it, you can actually make it. You can you actually know? do it. Yeah. And when that happened, I just, I, I made it my life's mission to make something happen in my career. Sure. And I was blessed enough, man, to simultaneously uh, come to Vallejo. Uh, 
I wound up getting a job in Marine World. I'm like 20 years old. I'm like scared. This is hilarious to me. Um, yeah. It is. <laughs> and I worked at Orchard Supply Hardware. James well. worked at Orchard Supply Hardware. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he washed and, elephants or whatever right. he did. Yeah. And Marine World at the time. Now it's Discovery Kingdom or whatever. But I'm there, you know, just making my minimum wage and happy to get it. Just enough to get gas money in my car and be able to, you know, flirt with these little girls around here. It's so I'm doing my thing, but uh, nothing's happening fast enough. And I remember my mother um, telling me that uh, if I would just stay focused and be patient, she would book me some studio time and pay for it because I didn't have enough to pay for studio time. You right. know, she would book studio time with um, a guy named Felton Pilot. The really? Can function. And I uh-huh. was like, really? You have access? How do you even know Con- uh, Felton Pilot? Well, she had a friend of a friend that knew him and had wow. access. So. Your mom is a social animal. She, I think so. She, she just, really is. I yeah. mean, she's she's got the charisma that you know everybody's drawn to. Yeah, and yeah. just as a sidebar, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have been on. You pulled me into radio on your mom's show, Mama Knows. That's right. Yeah. And uh, man, I, your mom is just so lovable and oh, loving. Wow. You know, she yeah. she's so warm and and it, and that. Knowing you and your brother Jacques, the apples didn't fall very far from the tree. Thank so you, we know where you, you got it from. <laughs> the uh, the encouragement that your mom gave you now mm. is is kind of a launching pad. So meanwhile, all the rest of Vallejo knows James Early is this bad bass player, and your mom's just saying, "Stay focused, James. Yeah, we'll get you some studio time." So I, then I think so. Yeah, let's pick it up there. So okay, I'm away from my friends though. I'm by myself. I didn't really have any chums up here. And so I was eager. I'd been doing some home demos, but they sounded like home demos. Right. And she was like, well, you know, I can get you into a real studio at least to do a song there. And and I think she was just trying to lift my spirits up, as I said. And so um, she got me in uh, with Felton Pilot and I was like blown away that she was even able to do that. And so she did. I met Felton. He was running the studio. It was no big deal there. I, you know, I'm trying to be humbled. And I'd already met famous people. So even though I was a huge fan of Felton, I tried not to overwhelm him with my, my awe of him and when I saw him. But That's I was how just, I behave around James all the time. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, and for our listeners who are um, yeah. outside of Vallejo, Felton Pilot was one of the founders of Confunction, which at the time was the biggest thing that had come out of Vallejo. Second to Sly Stone. Second to Sly. Well, at, at that particular time, yes, they were the biggest thing. They were in the Vallejo. big deal in Vallejo. So, yes. really, the big deal in Vallejo uh, prior to them, of course, was the great, great, great Sly Stone. Yes, and 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 prior to him, Raymond Burr of all people. Raymond but, Burr. Well, and uh, Johnny Otis. And actually. Johnny Otis. Yeah. Okay, so uh, but around uh, the late seventies to the mid eighties. Vallejo's uh, legendary band Confunction Mm -hmm. was really the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. So to be in the studio with Felton Pilot and be around here, that was a big deal. It was huge. That's the deal. That's the deal. Yeah, right. It was. It was. And I I was really blown away, but I'm trying to be humbled and I didn't want to scare him off. So I'm like, hey, how you doing? And I, you know, I need to record a song or whatever. So he let me do that. And I think he was impressed because I, I played everything on it and uh, sang all of the harmonies and background vocals and lead. And he uh, I think he was impressed because I was so young and I really knew my way around music. Um, now, were you producing this song yourself or were you allowing him to guide the process? No, nah, that's just it. I think, you know, Felton knew to let me do it and he did. Uh-huh. But he's a producer. I mean, and he was then. I wasn't yet a producer, but he allowed me to do it. And I think he was impressed by how much I knew. And right. I wasn't trying to For show a off. Kid, I was just in you there. You came into the studio and you knew doing your way thing. around it. Doing my thing, you know. And uh, I came in as a client, and that was it. And I, I had, I did the song, and then I remember I needed to come back and do some overdubs. What's the name of the song? Oh man, what was the name of the song? I hope it's something sexy. It's it's not something that stuck, I guess. I couldn't believe that she could do that to me. Was the name of the that song? Is that was something <laughs> sexy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a great song. It was fun. But anyway, Felton. Um, you know, I, I think because of money or whatever, I, I you know how you do a couple of days and then you come back and do a little bit more. I think I had just about everything done, but I needed to do a couple of overdubs. So I wound up coming back um, to do that after about three or four weeks. And um, Felton had told me then that uh, he was going to be opening up because at the time it's, the studio was in his home, though. Oh, OK. I must tell you that right. the studio was in his home. What and, year was this, James? 
1987, 87, 86, 87. Okay. Right in that window. We're talking about the house in Somerset, right? It was like up off of Georgia Street. No, no, no. this one was off of um, kind of on the American Canyon side. Oh, okay. Mini, Mini Drive over there on wow. that side. Um, he um, lived over there at the time, uh-huh. and um, so anyway, I worked with him there first, and then I wound up going over to Somerset. Okay, but uh, that was later, and so anyway, I did what I did, and he um, had said to me the second time that he saw me that he was going to be moving his studio into a building and he needed uh, someone to run the studio with him. And already I thought he was just having small talk with me or what, but he's telling me he needs an engineer in his studio. Well, right. And then eventually when I didn't say anything, cause I didn't even know if I should, he said, well, so you're interested in working in the studio, uh, running it at night. Cause I want to have it around the clock. I was right. like, and again, you I'm didn't working know at Orchard. He met you. I'm working at Orchard and Marine World. I was like, uh, heck yeah, man, I'm going to do this, right? Sure. And he was like, uh, Were you okay. an engineer? Did you know you were an engineer at the time? I was not an engineer at the time. Okay. And so that was the other part of it. The part two is I told him yes and was happy and, ec- and ecstatic, but then I had to humble myself real fast and be like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. I don't, I'm not an engineer. I have to learn this. And I'm not, craft. And he's probably assuming that I'm an engineer, so I better tell him sure. now before I leave. Don't let it drag out. Don't let yeah. it, you know, mushroom. And so I just told him, I said, hey, man, I really would love to do it, but I don't know how to operate any of this stuff. And I knew that the next thing out of his mouth was going to be like, oh, I'm sorry. I need somebody that knows so we can get on with it. Yeah. Right. But he actually said... When I said, I'm sorry, I don't know how to operate any of this stuff, and I was really sad and felt dejected already, he said, you know what, I'll show you how to run all this. And I swear, that I heard the angels sing at that moment. I, right. I know oh, yeah. I did. Yeah. It wasn't just like I'm imagining. I heard angels, like Star Trek theme, you know. And so I was like, whoa. And so he just said he was That's show like me. admitting to Mickey Mantle, like, yeah, you know what? I know we had a good time yesterday, but I don't really know how to play baseball. <laughs> and Mickey Mantle says, you know what? Just, you, don't worry. Yeah. Don't worry. We got it. Covered. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but just it was, come back tomorrow. Yeah, It was great, man. He said, yeah, he basically said, come back tomorrow and I'll show you how to do it. And he did. And so long story short, he taught me really fast because Felton, a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that Felton is some kind of um, technical genius. He's a technical savant. He yeah. is. He absolutely is. It's kind of freaky how intelligent this man and how smart he is about electronics and how you know he's he's a fabulous musician he's a multi-instrumentalist himself Mm -hmm. he can play 20 instruments phenomenally right and he's a great singer he plays the trombone he plays the trumpet i mean he plays plays, all the most he plays all of the mainstream instruments yeah but the first time i ever went to a confunction show and saw him burn on the trombone burn on the trombone i thought well, now it's serious. Yeah. I mean, because the trombone is not something you pick up casually. No, no. And so for that to be instrument number like six or seven or eight for him. Right. And for him to be able to burn on a trombone. If you meet somebody who can burn on the trombone yeah. but plays a bunch of other things first, yeah. you got to go way to Especially minute. the other exotic versions of brass like bass trumpet. Right. And he plays trumpet as well. You know, he plays a valve trombone. He plays, which is just like a trumpet. Sure. But it's it's a trombone where, that you play with valves. Right. But he right. can also do the slide. His nickname is Slide Clyde. But anyway, he, he's the, he was already, the bar was high. So believe me, I was nervous. But this guy also is a computer genius and a technical genius. And at Damn. the time, MIDI was the big thing about uh, sequencing and all this stuff. And he knew all that stuff already way better than anyone I'd ever seen or right. known. And so he takes me in, he shows me all that and gives me a crash course in it. And I think he saw something in me that I didn't even really see in myself because he knew that I knew some things about technical. And I think that was the other attraction musically that he had for me. But at the same time, he had to teach me a bunch of stuff so that I understood it. And, um, you know, but I guess he knew that I would be a good student. And and that's why I think he took me on. And so he did. he, He just it was a crash course and he wasn't he didn't let up. He was like, you have to know this. And uh, let me just go ahead and tell you this. He, he, um, when it came time to do what I needed to do, he put me in his studio, right? And uh, we, we, we moved into the new unit. We're there. All the equipment is now 
basically in boxes in the corner. <laughs> and he said, okay, I want you to unpack all of the studio equipment. He made the you reel build to reel, the studio. The, the mixer. Uh-huh. It was a huge mixer, you know, 32-channel mixer or whatever. But right. it had all, you know how it is, the spaghetti, we call it, all those cables. Yeah. It looked like a telephone operator in the days right. of old, all the, the uh, connection board. And he he said, unpack that stuff, put it together. And um, I, by the way, I'm leaving. I have a meeting. I'll be back in three hours. Your lesson in signal path yeah. Yeah. was to build a recording studio. It was absolutely. Here's was, all the stuff. Yeah. Build the studio. And good luck. And I'm leaving. I'll be back yeah. I, in not, three hours. I was hoping just he'd be on the phone or something, but now he's leaving. I got a meeting to go to. It's right. very important. So yes. anyway, he wanted it done, man. The sweat started flowing. I'm like, oh, God, this guy's going to come back. And none of it is. The, the boxes are still going to be. <laughs> You know, and so I just didn't know what to do. But I remember what he said. I took the instruction. I put it together. And when he came back, the studio was up and running. And I was terrified. I really was. Uh-huh. I was. I just knew I'm going to be fired when this guy yeah. comes back. He'll probably be sweet about it, but he'll say, I can't use you here because you, you didn't. You didn't pass the test. You didn't pass the test. Right? Yeah. But I did, man. And I, 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 I felt like I didn't, but I did. Now, knowing what you know now, mm-hmm. how, how built was the studio? It was done. It was I got done. It. I got it together. Okay. Yeah. I, I hooked it up right. Like you said, signal path. I, I got it worked out. Yeah. I listened. I'm a good listener. Yeah. And I listened to what he said and I followed the instruction. I think it was that and just desperation <laughs> that got me through <laughs> you it. You didn't want to go back to Orchard Supply. I didn't want yeah. to go back. I don't think I could. I probably at that point had already quit. So uh, anyway, I got it done and very rapidly I went from being just his apprentice to a full-time uh, engineer producer. I mean, because a lot of, because of his fame, the, the door kept not, you know, pe- there was knocks at the door. It was constantly. too much work for him to just do it. It was way too much work and people were constantly coming through and hip hop actually was new and there wasn't any home studio. So people needed music and all of these rappers that wanted to be rappers. In Northern California, hip hop was born in that building. It was. Really, if you think about it, I mean, there was so much now that everybody sees that came out of Vallejo, but everybody in our generation looked up to Confunction. Yeah. So people were coming through like crazy. So it was a crash course. And in, in within one year, I mean, I can't even count how many projects we did. But, you know, they were all local stuff. Nothing really took off. But we were doing some commercials, local commercials, uh-huh. scoring and jingles and stuff like that. So we were having good fun. So you fun, cut your fun. teeth in pretty much all manner of, yeah. you know, of recording for every format. Yeah. And I was making way a lot more money than I could have possibly made at Orchard. So I was really happy about that. But, yeah. you know, constantly working with people and... And found out really fast that I was becoming a producer just from that. Had a good time. And as I said, one of the uh, clients that came and knocked on our door was uh, Stanley Burrell, who later became MC Hammer. And uh, once we recorded his stuff, his first uh, CD, uh, he finished it up and he took it down to Los Angeles and wound up shopping a deal. And um, all the labels actually started a bidding war for him. And when that happened, uh, Capital, I guess, won the bid and he signed with Capital. I was in the studio with him when he got the phone call from his manager slash brother who called and said that he he got the deal. And I think the first check was like a million and a half or something. Wow. And which blew all of us away because, again, we're all, including Hammer, we're poor kids from the ghetto. You're suddenly in the room with a millionaire. Yeah. Suddenly, yeah. I mean, how many months removed are you from working at Marine World? Oh, to, only a few. Yeah. So I mean, I'm like, I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I'm just like, this has got to end really soon. And <laughs> yeah. this is probably a joke or something's going to happen where somebody's going to be say, just kidding to us or whatever. But that never happened. I mean, it, it just kept growing and growing. And so we had this phenomenal success. And that was really the beginning of the roller coaster ride. And it was definitely that. So let's talk about that roller coaster ride. From that beginning, you had suddenly a hit artist on your hands now you didn't yet have the hit record you had the record which everybody knew was good Mm -hmm. and with armed with that record that was good he went down shopped the deal started the bidding war Mm -hmm. and then now all of a sudden it's big time you know that with a a million and a half dollar check there's going to be a tour there's going to be more recording. Yeah. You're going to want more out of him. And this is right. just the beginning. What's next? 
Well, let me just back up a little bit and say that Hammer was very different from all the other rappers that were coming to us. Every other rapper was only that. Not to take anything away from them, but they were they were uh, just um, MCs, if you will. They would get on the microphone and they would basically rap over the music. And that was it. And they would go to a show and they would walk back and forth with the microphone. And that was the show. They had a DJ scratching. They might have had a couple of just maybe two dancers on the edge of the stage. But the the rapper himself was just rapping. One, two, one, two. Yeah, come on. And that was pretty much the show that you saw. A lot of people left disappointed or just like, oh, it was OK. It was nice to see whoever that was. But Hammer came a little bit different because he was really a dancer that chose to that became a rapper he was a dancer that became a rapper and also he was a preacher and a lot of people know that he'd become a preacher later but he didn't become a preacher later he was always a preacher when he was mc hammer he was one of those young preachers that you hear about but maybe not everybody sees but he was an ordained minister when he was like 18 or 19 so okay well let's for our uh, listeners who are not familiar with that community, when you're a young preacher like that, there's a certain amount of of charisma that's necessary to take that mantle. Mm-hmm. And that's really what you're talking about in, yeah. in the difference with him. Right. Is that he had that charisma where he knew that that you have to take a room and you have to inspire a room. A room. And you have to move the room emotionally. Right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, with that, okay, so he can rap. But that's only a part of the package. Well, as I said, he was also a dancer. He was a street dancer from Oakland Mm -hmm. who, you know, from his, you know, when he was a child, that's what he did. So later when he became a preacher, he got serious about himself. He was already out of the Navy um, by his early 20s. He'd spent uh, three years in the Navy or something. So by the time he was 20, 21, I think he uh, got his discharge, honorable, and he was out. And he decided to be what was called the Holy Ghost Boy. He was just going to do gospel rapping. But what happened is he had success, such fast success, I guess, man, because he was a dancer, he wanted to see if he could actually merge the two. But he knew he probably couldn't be a dancer doing the gospel thing. Right. So he just said, I'm just going to do secular. And, you know, I'm going to have fun. I will still do a song for God on each album, which he did. He, he still does to this day. He mm-hmm. does one song for the Lord on every album. But then everything else might be about dance and just having fun and partying or whatever. And um, so he would do these songs. And it, it was great what we did in the studio. They were really high energy songs, but it was it was phenomenal because he had a different process, too. He would come to the studio and me and Felton would make the music. But this guy would actually dance in the studio to the songs. Right. Him and his dancers okay. would have us turn the music up loud. And if it was if the tempo was too slow, if there was something in the rhythm that wasn't right, you know, you got to put a cowbell in there because I got to dance a little he bit more. He needed the room to move. He needed the room to move in, in the studio even. Right. And so it was very different process working with him, but we really enjoyed that. And uh, I so think that's what gave him that edge. The initial concept there. of that record you guys were in there and it had to move people. Yes. You know, booties had to move. We had to make dance records right from the gate. Oh, and, right. And we did. And so when he would go do the shows, I mean, people would go nuts. I'll never forget that. I would come to him. We would record the song in the studio and then take it right to a club. He had connections already. Right. We would take it right from the studio to the nightclub and he would perform at some of these clubs. They would already be expecting him as a guest. and We might even do the new song that we just recorded just to test it out. And I just remember how people would go crazy for this guy at a club. And he's unknown at the time. But at the same time, he's shopping his deal at Capitol. So I guess they caught wind of it and the word got around and he made a music video. And then that's what incited the uh, the, uh, the, bidding, the war. bidding war in Los Angeles. He had the foresight to make a video. Mm hmm. Wow. Beta. It was shot on beta. It by shot the way. on beta. <laughs> but I had at the time a friend who was training with a martial artist in Oakland named Dathan Taylor. Mm-hmm. And Dathan Taylor was was friends with Hammer. Mm-hmm. And so as you describe this, I remember um, my friend had a cassette that he let me listen to in his car. Mm hmm. Of those early, early recordings before, you know, before they'd hit the airwaves. And he said, man, you got to hear this dude from Oakland. His name is Hammer. He's a friend of Dathan Taylor. And he put it on and there was so much percussion. Yeah. And there was so much going on. It was so busy. Yeah. And I was just going, what is this? You know? (laughs) And then at the time you could say, man, this dude is really 
different. There's really a lot more going. I mean, you can't help but get charged from it. Mm-hmm. So th- the only thing, the only other thing going on, um, you know, in Oakland rap at the time was too short that we knew of. Mm-hmm. And it was so different. So different. Yeah. So, yeah, we 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 uh, we hear you. And now hearing that he, his process was different, really not that much it of makes, a surprise. But it, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes all kinds of sense. Yeah. And, and so it's, from there, what happened for us is uh, he shot the deal. He got the deal with Capitol. They put out the record. It did phenomenal almost right away. Yeah. For a brand new artist to go triple platinum was pretty crazy. And that and first triple platinum album was produced by you and Felton. Yes. Let's and get it started. Let's get it started. And so the, while the record was doing this thing, Hammer was out supporting it, doing shows. And so me and Felton were just back in the studio working with other people like E-40 and whoever else in Vallejo. Was coming in. And yeah. we were happy to be doing it because we really started to get a lot of work from that. And it was great. But what happened is uh, Hammer showed back up to the studio. It was kind of soon, too, because re- his record had would just been released only for a few months. And he was already in, enjoying this uh, success. But he comes back to the studio and we're like, hey, man, what's up? Well, you just came by to hang out? Or, well, hey, it's good to see you. And he's like, well, no, I didn't just come back to hang out. I, I need you guys to uh, shut down the studio and come out on again. the road with me oh, to come out on the road. And I'm like, already, I'm like, well, I'd never been on the road before. So yeah. I'm like already excited about this. Felton had been on the road before. You had but never I had, been on the road. No, I had never toured at that point. No, I'd done Man, local I stuff in LA. I cannot tell you yeah. I'm, what your reputation was like back then. Yeah. Because you're talking about right around 1988, probably, right? 88, 89, 89 maybe? Yeah. 88. Only. No, not yet 89, because 89 was Please Hammer Don't That's Hurt. Right. That's right. So you're talking about 87, 88. And yeah. already... Just as a musician in Vallejo, everybody knew you. A lot of people did, yeah, so because to of the hear, success. Well, and to hear at this point that you hadn't been on the road yet. I hadn't I been on the road. Going, Man, yeah, that's James yeah. Early. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he invited us out on the road, and it wasn't, initially it wasn't to play, though. Okay. Uh, he invited us out on the road because he told us, because <laughs> we wanted to know the reason we'd be out on the road. Yeah, right. That kind of dictates I'm dying how, long, to know too. Yeah. how long we'd be out there. But right away he said, what's happened is I'm doing these shows. This is Hammer talking to me and Felton. I'm doing these these shows, and what's happening is the engineers at the concert aren't giving me the sound that you give me in the studio. He right. was like, "The sounds real big, you know, wow. and I love that. I need that same big sound out on the road. I can't articulate to them or whatever. They don't understand me, and maybe I don't even... I don't know how to articulate it to him, but I need someone that does, or I need you guys to come in. That's neither here nor there. He needs the sound. However you arrive at it. Yeah. Yeah. Make it happen. Okay. And so, yeah, he told us that, you know, we were going to be salaried employees and we were going to live on a tour bus and hotels and all. I'm like, I'm there. Sounds pretty good. I'm I'm loving it. Yeah. He gave us enough so that our bills were, were paid and you know we were, it was great man and uh so we're out I on the road you now. to close the studio and come out on the road with yeah him. and of course like you'd mentioned i'm thinking well pretty soon we are going to need to record the second album okay but um we'll just book time at studios around the country which was what we did for a time you know just to just to record stuff there was remixes being done and different things had come up we wound up um being invited to a lot of uh, soundtracks that were of movies that were being done at the time. And I'll never forget uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie came out and they wanted right. us on that soundtrack. So we went to the studio and made a song for that. So we, again, we're booking studio time at different studios around the country. Where'd Memphis, you go to do that? Florida. Oh, I think we recorded part of it in Florida, part of it in Los Angeles, and maybe in Memphis. So you're bouncing around all over the place, getting to know all these other rooms across the country. Loving right. it, because I'm going to school. For Soaking me, it up. This is a university of yeah. music, and I'm learning. And there isn't a better one. Yeah. yeah. I'm you're learning. going to all the top-notch joints. Yeah, and meeting all the great engineers and, and all the techniques and being able to utilize some of my own now that I knew. And so... Um, doing this but at the same time from that process I was like wow this is cool but as soon as we're done I'm back on a tour bus I'm back in the hotel and I'm just twiddling my thumbs waiting until I can book time at the next city I don't even know what city we're going to be at where we're going to have enough time to do it it got really weird really fast so I suggested to Hammer for this next album and and I don't know, man, I, at that time, I'd never even heard of this, but I decided and this was before Pro Tools, before digital uh, audio equipment, portable equipment. I told uh, Hammer, I said, we need to have a studio on the road with us that we can have. And he was kind of like, well, portable. Wow, how are we going to do that? He didn't right. know. He, and, and I told him real fast. I said, well, wait a minute. The equipment that we had in the studio, I can actually have brought 
to a, a tour bus, but I need you to rent us or lease us or whatever. Provide us with a tour bus. And it's, it'll save us money anyway. It'll be cheaper than the studios that we have to rent time at. But let's get out the back of a studio bus, uh, I mean a tour bus, and, and turn and it into a studio. build the studio in it. Yeah, which meant um, we had we used a 16-track reel-to-reel machine. It's that Fostex B16 that's at Daryl's house, isn't it? Uh, no, I was actually, I, I bought a Tascam for that. Okay. The other one is one we we did Let's Get It Started on was the Fostex. Ah, uh, okay. But the next album, Please Hammer Don't Hurt Em, we actually purchased a Tascam, a 16-track, half-inch uh, machine, and then uh, we we got, I, I think, uh, a Panasonic mixer. For and recording so, studio nerds out there, yeah. the huge, uh, the enormity of the sound of Please Hammer Don't Hurt Em was recorded <laughs> on a half-inch 16-track. 16-track analog, yeah. And so we, we did that, and we fitted this uh, bus. And fortunately for us, our, our bus drivers were carpenters and were open to it. But they, there was a lounge in the back of the tour bus, and they took out all the TV. And, well, actually, they left the TV back there. They took out the, the cushions and all that stuff and basically created space so that we could put the reel-to-reel in there. The electronically, they fitted it properly. And so it was great. I was able to be on the road so we could do the shows. But after the show, right. we would come right back to the bus and work. And then so a lot of times we would get in the, the bus. bus in Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah. You know, and then hit the road. Yeah. And you could and you could work while the bus is moving. When we pulled into the next city before that, we do the sound check. But then we had hours before the show. I right. come back to the hotel and work even more on the bus or we'd park it backstage at the venue. This is and an so amazing story. I was really no in, kidding. It was my world. And I'm so glad, you know, I mean, I won't I won't bore you with it on this conversation. But it was just, you know, to, to cap it off, I think it was great because it kept me out of a lot of trouble. There was a lot of pretty girls out there and uh thankfully i don't have children (laughs) littered across the country i it could have happened because it was some pretty girls out there but it was for me it was about getting at the music and uh you know i was married at the time anyway so how you remained undistracted is is a mystery to all i stayed out of trouble man but i would i certainly stayed focused on the music and i wanted to do a better album than the first one which was great but I wanted to do something that was really going to explode Hammer's career, which hadn't yet. He wasn't yet a superstar. Did you just he say explode star. his career? <laughs> he wanted to explode Hammer's career. I got career. him in a bidding war. Uh, <laughs> you know? No, no. He was. He had a great deal, and the first album was okay, but he was still a mid-level yeah. uh, success at that point. He hadn't yet had the mega fame until the second album. I got gotcha. you. So we, we recorded uh, what we thought were 10 great songs. And one of them uh, being "You Can't Touch This," and that absolutely changed our lives. Yeah, you can't touch this. Just, wow, you know that was our first number one hit, actually. And you know, Felton had hits before, but I don't even think he had a number one pop hit before. Yeah. So you can't touch this was something we all shared in, and that album, the album was uh, number one for like twenty weeks or or more. The single sold 13 million copies or some crazy number right. right yeah huge numbers yeah it was ridiculous and so yeah i mean being out there doing that seeing it for me was like like we said uh, it was it was like going to the school of hard knocks because i learned so much just i got to meet all of the top executives uh they wanted to meet me you know what I mean? It wasn't like I was knocking on their office door. They were calling my phone. I yeah, don't even who know how they got the my Yeah, the creator number. of this work that is suddenly a faucet of money? Yeah, you know, and as a matter of fact, fly him here now. You know, that sort of thing. They would get my phone number. I don't even know how they got it. Even new numbers that I would get, they, they would just find them. These people are powerful, and they would find me and summon me at times, and it was great because they would – treat me you know fantastically and uh so from there i got such a big deal back then and our younger listeners didn't go through and 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 experience what a big deal that record was but yeah it was huge i mean up until then capital records they're they're uh who else did Capitol have? They had the Beastie Boys. Mm-hmm. Right. And the Beastie Boys license to Ill album was huge. It was enormous. It was, it was, yeah. But when the uh, Please Hammer Don't Hurt Them record was at its peak, Capitol Records and the iconic Capitol Records building, they took down their flag and they hoisted Hammer's flag. Ooh. Yeah. That was huge. Uh, even the see, Beastie Boys didn't get that. I didn't even know that. Wow. Yeah. You know. But what a great, you're, you're right, that's an historic building. It was great to be there and be around all the executives. And it was just a great ride. And this this music industry has so many secrets about it and so many facets to it. But to be actually in 
the storm and not just hear about it, but actually be in the eye of the storm is phenomenal. Most people, even in their, their greatest uh, escapade, might not ever see that sort of not fame. experience that sort and, of thing. And, and yeah. It was it was just great to witness. And I'm, again, humbled by that. And I really enjoyed um, the ride and getting getting to know things. And it helps even today what I do. It helps me to know and I'm able to teach others about the business and stuff like that, you know, and it's not it's not really a theory or an idea about what it might be like. I actually got to see at this time. You're like, what, like 24 years old. Yeah. And how are you not ruined? Yes. That's what I that's the next thing I want to know. I well, would have every time uh-huh. gone. Yeah. Twice. Just <laughs> right. And and. uh yeah, I just can't imagine that I would have survived. Self control yeah. and the hum- the being, a, you keep, and you keep saying, huh, and you are clearly a humble dude. Well, you know. but I mean, man, yeah. that is, that is, that how do you is, go on that ride that and not come lesson. back? Well, yeah. you know, I think that's the reason why I shared um, my story about being in the entertainment industry since I was like five or six years old. Right. So that when the hammer thing happened, I wasn't like awestruck by it really it wasn't a completely new concept to you yeah you had seen it i'd seen it i had a taste i'd been around fame and famous people and and great deals of money or people that had great deals of money i've been around it i've been to mansions and parties and hollywood and all that stuff so by the time the hammer thing happened i was probably the only one in the whole posse that was just kind of like it's great this is fleeting yeah it's great but yes let's stay humble Steady right. as she goes. Let's stay the course. Let's make sure that we stay focused and get back in the studio and work on another album. Let's think about the future. I mean, that was my whole thing always. Yeah. And whereas other people, yeah, were freaked out and they were like, oh, my God, I can't. I was just like, we don't really have time to trip off of that. We have to focus. So we're meeting famous people all the time. We're going to the Grammys now. Right. The American Music Awards. This Hammer's is one winning. of those experiences where you're just going through the country, really just making your way, cutting a swath through the middle of the country and if you're hammer you can wake up Mm -hmm. and decide who it is you want to meet that day you know where are you well i'm in memphis well who do you want to meet well who's here yeah and and you really on that tour are in a place that many people don't get to experience which is you wake up in a city and that city belongs to you for that day Mm -hmm. and if there's somebody in that city that's worth meeting you can meet them that's right (laughs) <laughs> what an amazing experience. It was great, man. And it's it's been great and it continues to be. And as I said, you know, um, being invited to Jimmy Iovine's mansion and, and then, you know, having him hire me into the studio to work on projects. And, Say what? Know, <laughs> I know, right? Hang yeah. out with this guy. Let me I mean, get my yeah, jaw I mean, off the floor here. My mind, too, though. I mean, but he's a great, phenomenal guy and just really cool people. He's really humbled and down to earth. But uh, Well, Jimmy Iovine has right now is, you know, made out of money. And he's yeah. known at this very moment by a, a whole generation of kids as the guy who was the half partner in Beats. Mm-hmm. And so they made all that money. But right. if you rewind his career to a lot of the places that people don't know about even at the time that you're talking about in the in the late 80s he had already done things like record tom petty yeah and you know he was already a force that that uh was firmly cemented and so this is the kind of company you're keeping on this tour yeah no, absolutely. Not even just the tour, but in in general, in just general. like I said, industry yeah. functions and yeah. Grammys and and all the the award shows and Oprah and Arsenio, just everything that was the hot show. Oh, Arsenio, man! Yeah, yeah, it was great to just be there, you know, on the set. You know, you see it on TV, but then to be there on the set, backstage, hanging out with him and all that is just like that. Right. That is surreal when it happens. And it's like, wow. I remember a few things about the Arsenio Hall show. And one of the things I remember clearly, and not just snapshot time, maybe just like video, is Hammer going lunatic crazy all over that stage. And lighting the place on fire. Right. And and thinking, I've never seen someone who's so fit. Yeah. Because he's clearly singing this song, at least least from what I could see. Yeah. He's dancing a million miles an hour. Oh, yeah. He wasn't lip syncing. He was doing his thing. And his pants are going a million miles an hour faster because you're like, what? Yeah, it's hard to yeah. even process, and it was so incredible, yeah, so impactful. It was, man, and I appreciate that. But it was just like crazy watching him every night. He was that way on any stage. So by the time we got to night the TV after shows, night after night, yeah, it was just kind of like, well, there he goes again, you know. But it was, it, you know, it's just great to see. And so from there, you know, I'm getting invited to work with other people, but not yet. Had I left uh, Hammer, I, I continued to work with him throughout the success of the release of 
Police hammered on heard him, and then we did let's get it started. Uh, no, excuse me, not let's get it started. We did too legit to quit. Uh, was the next album, and I, uh, simultaneously I was working with Oak Towns Three Five Seven on their second solo record, and um, just a ton of other stuff. Like I said, soundtracks. Um, I got to work with uh, Sly Stallone. He um, he was aware of Hammer's success, and he hired us to oversee the uh, soundtrack for. Uh, the Rocky Five film, and then um, from that we were invited to score part of it, which was great because uh, we started. You know, he gave us what he wanted. First, he sent a note, a letter, it might have been a phone call as well, saying what he wanted and what kind of music he wanted. And I just based on what he asked for, and I look, he also sent some clips from the movie, which hadn't yet been released, of course. He was still filming it and editing. And so when I saw the dailies, I was like, whoa, that's kind of cool, high energy. So I did basically a song for the film. And uh, he, when he heard it, he was just like, wow, this is great. You know, I want to meet these this guys. Is it. This is what I want. This is what I wanted. There's just one thing I want you to do, whatever it was. I don't even remember now. But he said there was one thing he wanted us to do and uh, that he would want to meet with us and tell us. I was I was really, really happy that I left this thing out. So here we now, go. There's there's all this opportunity to meet all these people. And yeah. you get a call from Sly Stallone. Yeah. He yeah. wants to meet you and tell you this piece of yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that I didn't get it quite right because right. I was in a studio in New York producing it at the time uh-huh. because we were on the road. And I would, <laughs> like I said, sometimes I would go to other right. studios if right. I needed to. If I didn't have the bus still, even though we had the bus, if it wasn't with me, I would record in whatever studio. And we were in Manhattan. And I remember booking studio time there and I did what I did. Where? Do you remember the studio? <sighs> no, I don't. Okay, please continue. I, Wait, I have to ask two questions before we get remember. too far past Sly. One is, is one of the things that he asked you, you have to give Frank a job. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give Frank a job over here. Yeah, over here. No, he, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. But I hadn't yet met him in person. So I'm, I'm in Manhattan right now. We, we did. We saw the dailies and we, we yeah. uh, actually scored to what we saw. We sent it to him. At that time, yeah, the internet was new, but I think we sent it over the internet. It was brand new at the time. And he got it right away. He listened to it. He said he liked it, but there was one thing he wanted us to add and that he would like to meet with us in Los Angeles. So um, I had my first Learjet plane ride. It was, he summoned you. He summoned us. And sent a plane. Sent a plane. Learjet. And I'm like, whoa. And honestly. Getting on a plane so Sly can meet us in Los Angeles. The plane was so small. That I was afraid to get on it. I ain't gonna lie, man. <laughs> yeah, it it really isn't much bigger than this table that we're sitting in front of. Yeah. And for but our it listeners, was beautiful Learjet. James Early is not a small person. Oh, no, he's a full nah, size dude. Yeah, he's I'm full a big dude. guy. Yeah, but yes, we, me, and about seven or eight other people got onto this little tiny plane. Yep. And uh, lean, great shape. Yeah, I feel like if you, um, you know, if you hadn't had that success in in uh, music hmm. early on, you probably could have been linebacker. Yeah, I probably would have been, you know, if I got invited to. But, uh, you know, I'm I'm going to meet, speaking of great bodybuild guys, but I'm going to uh, meet uh, Sly Stallone. He's, right. he's Rocky. Who at the time it was at the peak of his fitness, which was at the peak of fitness in general. Yes. He was, he was at, the, at, at that time, the fittest guy on the planet. He was both Rocky and Rambo. And Rambo. Right. He was the guy you didn't want to mess with. And so we go to his office, and I'm expecting what you guys imagine. I knew when we did meet with him, when we got off the plane and went to his office in Hollywood, I just knew that he was going to open the door and be hey yo how you doing over here so, yeah, what I want you to do is oh, it, I just I expected that because that's all I've seen sure but he was this phenomenal articulate um, uh, astute businessman and so polite to us man it blew me away I was just I was absolutely floored I did in fact judge a book by his cover I had no idea but he's um I've since studied up on him and everything. He he actually wrote Rocky. Yeah, that's his He's, that's his yeah. movie. Well, it's you know baby. what? And 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 I don't want to derail from your story for very mm. long, but he not not only did he write Rocky, but he got a meeting with MGM and MGM offered him $250,000 at the time he was the sleeping in a broken down Pinto. He didn't yeah. have anything. Yeah. He had nothing and he had the wherewithal to say, "No, thank you. I don't want to sell you this. This is my vehicle." Yeah. It wasn't because just that, though. They wanted to buy it from him yeah. outright, leave him out of it, yes. give him $250,000 to walk yeah, they away, wanted and then they were going to cast Ryan O'Neill. That's yeah. right. But he insisted and said, no, I want to star in this film, and you can keep your money. 
you know, of course, they wound up signing what him a anyway. Move. And then look what happened. I mean, yeah. he just he he basically created his own stardom. So that plays self-made. right into what you said. I mean, he's an astute businessman. He's articulate. Mm-hmm. He knows exactly what he's after. Yes. And now you walk into the room, and what he was after was James Early, and there you are. Phenomenal gentleman. Um, one day I'll bore you with what his office was like. Because there's no crazy. you don't tell boring stories at I all. <laughs> I want every bit of it. I love it. It was just crazy, man. His office. The short version of it is: we come in and he we he has a, an office or at least an area that you go into where the secretary is that looks like every other office you've ever seen. Have a seat, Mr. Stallone. Will be with you. We waited the traditional 30 minutes that you might imagine, maybe even 45, but okay. you're, you're going to wait. But you're about to meet Sly. You're going to wait. If it's three hours, right. you're going to not go anywhere. I wait and till so, Thursday. To yeah. You Sly. know what I mean? I might, I might have to be kicked out of this building. Uh-huh. So anyway, I'm sitting there and uh, we get invited in to eventually after 30 minutes. And uh, you know, the secretary says, oh, follow me this way. So we go into the office and there's a door right there. Uh-huh. It's not like we had to walk down a hallway. We go right through the door this dude's office is huge. It's not just your average size room. It's a giant room. Like, whoa. And there's inside of this giant room, there's just a bar and a giant bed. <laughs> a giant <laughs> bed, which I've never, ever, I mean, almost like that. some crazy fairy tale. <laughs> The bed was bigger than anything I've ever seen before in my life. It wasn't. It wasn't a king. It was like this was a custom made bed. It was a custom made like seventeen, and it was kings. enormous. That was huge. It's like Shaq's bed, right? Yeah. yeah. No, but it was like seventeen kings. Jesus. And, and it, it went out further than what a you know a normal right. bed stops. This would. It, it was like twice the length of a bed, and so it was a big giant rectangle in this room that was beautiful. <laughs> That you can only imagine what he's doing in that. Yeah. And he's, he's got, you know, he's in there. He's looking sharp. He had a nice shirt on. You know what I'm saying? He's looking cool. And he had two Playboy bunnies. They were twins. and They were twins. Oh, and Lord. they were both gorgeous. Oh, and Lord. they were in lingerie. <laughs> I know it's crazy. They were in. You were going to skip this, this story. <laughs> I just it blew me away, dude. It even now that I'm away. thinking about it, and we come hey, in this there. This was a guy in the middle of the week. This is his work day. It's this Wednesday. is what his work yeah, day. Yeah, was. This gotta, is a, it's a Wednesday. It's not Saturday. I gotta or take Friday a night. It was like Wednesday. At, Hold my calls. It was like Wednesday at like eleven, you know, a.m. Right. So. I'm like, whoa. And he, he was dressed nice, and he was very, hey, how you doing? You know what I mean? I'm, I'm Sylvester Stallone. Sit down, have a seat. And so we were happy to see him, me and a, a couple other guys that were there uh, representing Hammer or whatnot. We came in there, and we sat down, and um, I'll just never forget. He asked us, did we want something to drink? And, we, and I, of course, you're almost afraid to ask. And he's sure. like, no, no, you, you want it? And I was like, yeah, just give me a soda. So he had the young ladies get up and go to the bar. Make the sodas for us, whatever it was. You know, I didn't want to drink you in front of nice. Sly. Yeah. Right. They bring it back to us. They give us the drinks. They don't even speak, even though I'm sure they could. They didn't. <laughs> and they came back after they were done with that and sat at his feet on the floor. It's good to be the king. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was very kingly. I'll tell you that. And so that was it. They just sat there on the floor. And he spoke to us on the edge of the bed, by the way. He didn't have a chair. Uh-huh. He was on the edge that of the bed. That was his chair. That the was edge of the chair. bed. The edge was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he's sitting there. He's doing his thing. He's talking to us and telling us what he wants. He was very articulate, very specific, because this is his baby, right. about what he wanted. And at the same time, so we, we met with him for like two, maybe three hours just talking. And he was, it was like time stopped you know what I mean but he's a great guy he's very funny when he wants to be very jovial but at the same time very matter of fact and very business and wow I just really enjoyed that experience being there but he was you know once we got down to it you know I knew exactly what he wanted he told me and he said he trusted us because he liked already what he heard and we did it submitted it to him later and the the film came out and did great and I'll never forget he invited us to the premiere in Hollywood did you go Oh, absolutely! Because okay. we, we were, he invited us to right. sit with him. Oh wow! No kidding. There was a ton of people there, and he was like, "These guys are going to sit with me." You know what I mean? Wow. So we sat with him and we watched it. And it That's was incredible! Like, yeah. Holy moly! Yeah, it was just crazy. It was this like is, a dream come true. This man, was the sure. boring. James <laughs> was not going to bore us. With this <laughs> I don't want to bore you with the. With hey the story. man, it That's was, a short story too. Remember, there's just, more detail. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there is, but I won't. I won't <laughs> yeah. bore you with that. So I have to ask, uh, all of this happened during the Hammer Tour. Yeah. And uh, 
When's the last time you talked to Hammer? <sighs> um, you know, like I said, what happened after the success that we had, it was so mega, everything kept growing and growing, including right. Hammer, yeah. you know, and I don't really fault him. I mean, you you hear all these stories, but his fame grew so much so fast. His finances grew so much so fast, but attention and everything, he probably didn't sleep at night. And then what happened was he became n- never inaccessible to me. I could always, if I needed to talk to him, I could. But he had so many bodyguards after a while and handlers and just hangers on. Hangers M- on, yeah. Many of them that I never met before in life. You know, I would go right. away and then even doing the sly thing that he had, he assigned me to do, when I come back to try to share it with him, there's like seven bodyguards that don't even know me that are trying to stop me. It's new people. You can't even go into his dressing room. I'm right. like, the hell I can't. You know, he wouldn't have one if it weren't for me, and he'll tell you that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, of course, you know, he came out one time and heard me getting into it with the bodyguards. It was like, no, no, no. This guy always comes in here no matter what. But I could see that it was getting out of hand. Right. And I just said, I don't know. I'm getting offers to work with other people, and I got tired of being on the road. So you got off the bus. You chose to get off the bus. So I to chose speak. to get off the road. Yeah, we. Were, but at that point, we weren't even on the buses anymore. Yeah. We, eventually, well, I was speaking fame, figuratively, but literally, you weren't on the bus anymore. Well, what happened is he eventually got so big, Capital bought him a 727 a plane, jet, right? Yeah, and painted Hammer Time on the side of it, and so we flew everywhere we wanted to go after that. You know, at that point, but it was and gone were the days. Yeah. And so it just got, to me, a little out of hand, though, because of that. You know what I mean? I liked how organic us traveling together and being in a smaller space and hanging out and being able to talk and hang out like And it forced that intimacy that you could could use to stimulate the creativity. All of us, the entire crew, we were all really bonded. Right. It was a closeness. We were a family. And this family was being um, diluted, if you will, with yeah. other people yeah. and people that were glad handing and, and people that weren't necessarily our friend, but right. were coming after the money, if yeah. you will. Sure. And so, uh, you know, and, and I don't know that Hammer had time to really deal with that properly. But instead of, you know, grabbing That's him and big, shaking big him. That's a big, big challenge. And yeah. you're right. He was so busy that I could see that getting out of hand. Yeah. And, and he doesn't have time to deal with that. Yeah. And as his friend, I mean, I, I considered him to be a, a dear friend. You know, at the time, uh, you know, I couldn't grab him and shake him and say, hey, man, you know, you need to stop this. Snap out of it. He wouldn't have snapped out of it. And I don't think most people would. And so I just chose to go my own way and work with other people because I, I up to that point, I'd been an exclusive producer working with just hammer artists and him and whatever he assigned me to. Right. But the phone was ringing. I was getting offers from L.A. Reed and a lot of other people to do other things that I had to turn right. down or were being turned down for me. I right. might not even get the message. I found out later that I was getting offers from different people. And so anyway, I just Incredible. got out there. I wound up, wow. you know, doing my own thing. And, uh, yeah, I wound up working with Jimmy Iovine and um, spent a lot of time working at Interscope Records and uh, pretty much doing production that was the, at all the major labels. That was pretty much labels. the beginning of Interscope, too. It was yeah. the very beginning of yeah, Interscope, right. yes. Ted Field and um, Jimmy Iovine started a label called Interscope. Right. Actually, it was Interscope Film at first. Huh. And then it became Interscope Records. And they merged with David Geffen and right. Gigantic. Huge. Yeah. But bef- even before that, when they were still like the small label, who was on the label at the time? Who at the time... Um, it, Jimmy Tupac, Iovine Tupac, worked with... Everybody, I mean, but to start his label, that was like his his pushing off. You know, he yeah. was going to become. Now he went from sort of producer to mm-hmm. executive. Tupac had been um, carrying bags for um, Digital Underground, yeah, and he was a dancer for them. And so eventually, he you know had wound up rapping. I think on one of their side, uh, one of their singles, uh-huh. and from that he started to get attention, right? And he wound up getting uh, signed to Interscope Records very early in okay. his career. Yep, and um, even before Death Row came there, he was signed to Interscope Records, and uh, as well uh, the actor Mark Wahlberg. He was um, Marky Mark before that. Right, right. <laughs> Marky Mark of the Funky Bunch. And so he was signed there because um, uh, I think Jimmy Iovine had taken a liking to Donnie Wahlberg as yep. well as the, he had an interest in New Kids on the Block, even though they were signed to Columbia Records. Right. He befriended um, uh, Mark uh, Donnie Wahlberg. And Donnie, he, you know, basically told him, I have a younger brother, Mark, who used to be in New, New Kids on the Block. A lot of people don't know that. Right. And now, you know, he's more into the rap thing. 
So I'd like to do a, an album on him. And he was, he was supported by Interscope and it came out and did very well. And so uh, I had uh, the, the honor of working with him on some of his early stuff. Didn't Interscope film do uh, Rattle and Hum as well? I, think, I don't know. I know he had a role in that. I just don't know exactly what Honestly, I don't know. But I know that Ted Field had a great uh, string of hits. Yeah. Uh, his He comes from money, Ted Field. And I know that so, Jimmy Iovine did stuff with everybody. John Lennon. Yeah, Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, yeah, Steve, Stevie Nicks. Yeah, Eminem. Well. No, he's a, he's all a, worked together. And and also, um, what's the band that did? Uh, Don't forget about me. Don't Simple Minds. Simple, Simple Minds. Minds. He yeah. pro- he produced that. Yeah, there you go. And that's you know he's a phenomenal. Jimmy Iovine is a phenomenal engineer and producer himself. A lot of people don't know. Hmm. And that was really the thing. Working for him was like going to school too because he was great. But at the same time, he, first of all, he wouldn't work with you if you weren't able in the first place. But if you were, he knew that he he could wasn't going to give you the kind of shot that that felt gave you. Right, right. He he was he, he was beyond. You better be good enough already. But he knew then that he could talk to you and tell you what he wanted as an engineer, right? As opposed to just even executive. Most executives are not musicians; they're not right. engineers. And so, honestly, the communication can be kind of strange. But with the, with Jimmy Iovine, it was great because he could tell you, uh, you know, give me a little bit more highs in the vocals. As a matter of fact, the frequency, you know, a little bit around two thousand. I need a little bit more of that, you know, that sort of thing. Or the mix isn't right. You know, I need more compression. In the mix, you know yeah, what I mean. He would yeah. tell you what it. He understood to be. what was missing in the recipe. Yes, and could tell you exactly what that ingredient was. That ingredient was that needed to be replaced or enhanced. Right. And so it was great working with him. I really enjoyed that. Tell us what you told us uh, earlier about uh, Luther Vandross. Oh, I was telling you that uh, you know, as I said, after I left Hammer and his crew to go work with other people. Um, you know, for a time, you don't know where the work's going to come from. And I do have to mention um, um, Denzel Foster and Thomas McElroy, um, the producers of In Vogue, creators of In Vogue. Yeah. Who were before that. They Bay Area were, legends. Legends. Right? Yeah. Before that, they were um, they were in a band. They were members of the band Club Nouveau uh-huh. and also were mentored by Felton Pilot. Huh. I hadn't yet met them really yet uh, with, at that time when they were being mentored by Felton before and during Club Nouveau. But once that happened, they had success. They got out there and did their thing and wound up producing Tony, Tony, Tony and, uh, and created this female group that was going to be the new Supremes. And they were going to call it in vogue, pretty, yep. pretty girls. And they were going to sing harmony and, you know, change the world. And, and kind of it was kind of cool because what they did is they married R&B and hip hop. They yeah. took those two things and put vocals over the top of that sure. and kind of created a new sound by doing that. And so at that point, I did meet them. I they would, really were pioneers of that sound. They were, truly, you know. And I, and I would run into these guys at industry functions. Uh-huh. And at that time, we... They were young go-getters. They were young go-getters, and I was too. And so we really hadn't, like I said, knew each other, but we knew of each other and we befriended each other that way because yeah. we knew all the same people. We all were from the Bay, Barry legends and, yep. and young guys, young entrepreneurs. So for that reason, we had a like-mindedness and we all hit it off. And so I just kept seeing them after a while, time and time again, at industry functions, Grammys, right. American Music Awards. I would run into them there. We'd hang out in the green room or whatever and just laugh about stuff, hang out check out the chicks <laughs> and so we we're just having fun doing all that and then um one day i remember telling them that i was planning on leaving hammer how do you guys feel about that um they were both quick to tell me you know what if it's time it's time it's time for you to do your own thing and they'd been through something similar to that so they you know they, actually, they went through it with club nouveau they did right. and they gave me good advice and told me to just believe in yourself and you'll be fine and, and even went beyond that they said that it might you know because it this industry can be strange for a person that leaves something huge and then goes to do something else. You might be left out in the cold. You don't know if you're going to be blackballed or whatever. You right. just don't know. And um, Tommy and Denny actually kind of just told me, man, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll make sure you have work. And they did. And I forever owe them for that because wow. they did. They they almost right away had me producing songs. Uh, so you got started on, uh, on In Vogue. 
Yeah. I mean, well, I was doing that. I was working on other things, but they just made sure that I continued to work is what I'm saying. Sure. I had other work as well, but it was fun because I really liked Tommy and Denny. Um, We had, you know, we came from the same place. They were Bay Area. I wasn't out in Florida or New York. I was here in the Bay and able to work with these guys that were cool. And they stayed in the Bay. Yeah, they stayed in the Bay. Their studio was here. or We were working out of Fantasy yeah. and um, at uh, Starlight Studios in Richmond. And then ultimately decided they were going to create their own place. And so, anyway, we hit it off and we were doing a lot of stuff. They're in the studio working with Vogue. They brought me in to work with Vogue. And so I'm hanging out with the girls and, you know, I'm playing on other projects for them as well. They would hire me to play bass and guitar and produce on different things. So it was great just being around these guys. And, you know, uh, just going back to mentoring, you know, I have to give them credit. you know, these guys are my age, but I have to call them my mentors as well. Maybe I mentored them a little bit as well, but, you know, they were mentored by Felton Pilot and so was I. But at the same time, they continued to give. So they schooled me a lot about the industry things, how to deal with industry executives or or uh, how to submit material um, just whatever advice I needed in production at that point in my career, they were there to tell me and just had no problem you know basically gave me a home after hammer it was great when you decided to get off the bus the hammer bus Mm -hmm. what was felton doing um felton was at that point felton had become hammer's musical director okay and then uh he went from the using djs on stage to actually a full band having a band right a full band it was huge it was uh, yeah, like seven keyboard players and you yep, know, yep. a drummer and a yeah, percussionist. Yeah, Melvin Car- and, Carter you know. was on that in that band. Yeah, uh, Rich Aguan was in that band. Yeah, uh, Juan yeah. Escovedo, mm-hmm. Billy Shoes Johnson, all the great guys. Uh, yeah. Sandra Manning played keys in yeah, that band. Right. Um, Dave Agent played bass in that band. Paisley. Yeah, Paisley was. That's right. <laughs> yes, man. Yes, and so many others, man. Some really great guys. George Williams and Michael Buckolds and a lot of talented musicians. Um, Ken Franklin. Ken Franklin. And, yeah. and uh, just a lot of great guys. And so, and also Tyrone Duncan was uh, Hammer's drummer for many years. And uh, we called him T Super, but phenomenal drummer. And, uh, you know, it was just a great bunch of guys. But Felton basically was overseeing that. Right. And, um, having his own issues uh, on a business level with Hammer's label and whatnot. And I think even he was kind of growing tired of certain things. So he continued to do that for a time, and then eventually he left as well. So that's that's pretty much what happened there. But Felton kind of just went another way. And then around that time, I think he was considering, or maybe the guys from Confunction were considering Considering getting, getting back together, which they did. Yeah. Boy, was Vallejo waiting for that. Oh, every I think the world was. Yeah. We all were, yeah, for sure. And uh just to give a shout out in that direction, boy can function is sounding great nowadays. They always have though, but you're right. I think they may sound better today than they ever did. Well, I think that's true. <laughs> I mean, they managed to um inject uh youth into the old funky sounds mm-hmm. cuz a lot of those bands that came from the 70s, you know, they just maintained a specific sound. Mm-hmm. And and that's great. Like the Gap Band, you go see the Gap Band. Yeah, they sound great. They sound like the Gap Band, but mm-hmm. Confunction, they sound young. And energized, and Michael Cooper is, you know, he looks like he could bench press everything that's on the stage. And so they're, uh, they're sounding great still. Yeah, Michael, Coop, still Michael Cooper. The trombone. Michael Cooper is definitely not one to run up on if you think that you're going to try to have your way with him. He's a, a very strong uh, gentleman and a, uh, a sheriff. <laughs> So uh, he's not he's not someone that you just he's not a pushover. No, not at all. He's uh, currently and always has been. He's not just new to law enforcement. He's been a police officer for probably 40 years. And so he's you know, they're great, talented guys. You know, Cooper, in addition to those things, he's 
probably one of the best guitar players I've ever heard. Man. He really is. You know, oh, just terrific. Phenomenal musician. He, too, is a drummer, Michael Cooper. Uh-huh. And, yeah, I uh, wouldn't put it past anybody in that band to play anything. Yeah. I mean, that's just the level of talent you have to expect from everybody. And maybe yeah. everybody doesn't play everything, but you can't. You, you don't get caught unaware. Yeah. But great guys, you're right. Their show is incredible. Their man. show they, is incredible. Uh, it's always worth it for you to spend your money at a confunction show. That's uh, true. That's all I can say. That's true. Eric Young on the bass. A little oh, shout out man. to Eric Young. He, Brian Collier on the drums. That's yeah. a bad drummer. Yeah. Man, he's bad. Oh, yeah. He's ridiculous. Uh, EQ, yeah. EQ, I'm a bass player, and I look at that guy playing, I go, wow. Yeah. Listen to that. You He's know? something. And plus, EQ's such a great what guy. What an entertainer, too. Oh, yeah. That's that's his true acts, I believe. Uh-huh. He's a phenomenal bassist. He really is a funky dude. Yeah. But I think the thing that really makes him stand out is he's an entertainer. Yep. Uh, in a way that we don't get anymore. You know, this guy is constantly moving. And if he could do the splits on the stage, I'm sure he would. He takes you know, a bass solo. Uh, and this is for our listeners and some, some somewhat for Pete. EQ takes a bass solo and it might be a five minute bass solo. Yeah. And he might play bass for two minutes of it. Yeah. Because he'll start out and he'll do something ridiculous on the bass. And while yeah. your mouth is agape, he'll do something else to make you start laughing yeah. and really draw in the crowd. And he's such an entertainer that what an asset. Yeah. And that band's got assets in every direction. Yes, they do. Everybody's good. Everybody's phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. What a great band. Yeah. So Felton, he's really, I'm happy for him. I'm loving to see him in his element again. Uh-huh. Um, he continues to make music and produce though. He's doing things. He's scoring films and uh, doing quite a few things. And actually, Confunction um, currently is releasing uh, a reunion album. And I call it a reunion because they haven't done an album in 25 years or so. Wow. And so this, they're just now releasing that. And I was blessed enough. Felton called me in to work on a song with him, produce a song. Wow. And, uh, and I'm that's playing, cool. I'm playing bass on a song. And it's, hey. it's, it, it's, it's lovely because this particular song is a duet between Confunction and Tony, Tony, Tony. No kidding. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just like, oh man, I'm done. I'm cooked. For a Bay Area music fan, you yeah. just, man, yeah. you just described a marriage that's yeah. you know come on Dallas. i love it man yeah. and I'm, I'm playing bass on that song so i'm like yes this is nice wow. <laughs> that is nice yeah. so uh let's talk about what you're doing nowadays mm-hmm. and who you're working with um well i'm among f- uh others i'm like i said i'm in the studio working on this confunction record which we just finished it's uh being mastered now and wow will be released soon um, but I'm working on a few projects. Uh, some of them I can't speak of because they're not yet released, but I'm doing some great things. I, um, I've been in the studio with, uh, E40's family working on some things. They have a film that they just finished up starring E40. Mm-hmm. So I'm, um, currently scoring that film and, um, uh, that's a him. dude who's not afraid to get his hustle on, man. Not at Absolutely all. Absolutely not. Not at all. Right. He and it's works a great, hard. It's a great comedy film along the lines of like a Kevin Hart film or something uh-huh. that you might imagine. A lot of funny stuff going on. It's like a, I want to call it a hood comedy, but it's 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 more comedy than it is hood. But it's got those elements, of course, because it has yeah. E-40 and yeah. whatnot. But it's been great. And so helping to film that, um, just, you know, I've been on the set a lot. Um, they're just about finished with the filming, but I'm. Uh, from that, I'm inspired to score it, and so that's what I've been hired to do. do no some kidding, of the scoring for the film. Yeah, wow. And um, yeah, just Incredible. like I said, helping to supervise hey, look, the man, soundtrack. I'm just gonna throw it out there. Can you bring me with you on a field trip <laughs> when you're gonna score? I I just want to watch you in that process. Yeah, I'd love to have you there, man. All it's right. great. What we have to do is, you know, they put the film up on a screen. Yep, and then you basically put music to that uh-huh. it could be music that you've already recorded but in many cases you actually have to create music to what you're seeing sure so you got to look at the scene and watch it and then basically create a mood for it mm-hmm. in whatever way if it's a hip-hop movie you need to do some hip-hop music underneath right but, but if it's what? a love story which yeah. this is not you need to put violins and strings sure. in and make it sound really sad or loving or whatever it might right be right but you create the uh the, the oral mood 
yeah. or enhance uh, the visual with the aural mood. Yeah, yeah. what kaiju more is? It, is it like the dialogue, or is it the images that are that are on the film? Like, what what do you feel more, or is it? A, it's obviously probably a mix. It's but, all of the above. Yeah. yeah, you you look at it and you go, well, you know what? If you don't have anything, and see, that's just it. There might be a scene that needs silence though, too. Sure, because you sure. can actually do music that gets in the way, but sometimes you don't know that until you try it first. Yep. You try some stuff, you look at what's going on, and as, as long as your edit is good, then you you make the appropriate music for that scene. Now you said that it's it's the Stevens family that's making this movie. Mm-hmm. How much of uh, Earl's involvement was in the creation of this film, the writing of the film, and the it was written by his younger brother uh, Danell. Okay, who so Danell wrote it. D shot, yeah, and uh, D shot also directed it. And um, a lot of people, wow, yeah, well, yeah, a lot of people don't know it. And I swear. Well, here's why I asked the question, uh, because I don't have any uh, uh, doubt in the capability of either one of them. But what I know about them is that uh, they they are musicians. I mean, they're rappers and their uh, persona is that they're rappers from the hood and they are the genuine article. Mm -hmm. But I also know that they both read music. So when you have a uh, a film that was created uh in this case by Donnell a guy who thinks musically mm-hmm. and understands that process intimately how much space is there for the person scoring it in other words if you're watching or if you're scoring a film that was created by somebody who's a pure film director who didn't come from music mm-hmm. You know, maybe they don't leave you as much open space or maybe they don't consider that or maybe as they're shooting something, they don't say, well, okay, let's let that be for a while and give that a moment because there's a musical moment in there. Mm -hmm. And and maybe not everybody thinks that way. Did you find that because you've scored other things that this film played more to your ability to score and create mood for it because of that? I yeah, I think, you know, I, I it I'm thankful that I've been experienced in it cuz it helps. But when you again, when you look at a movie and you have to add the music that's appropriate for that film and, you know, um in this case, I mean Rocky 5, you know, is one thing and I've mm-hmm. done a few. But I'll, just to give you the extremes, Rocky 5 is still going to be more about athleticism and that whole thing. Right. You're going to hear this music that's uh, very strong and energetic, but at the same time, uh, it has um, uh, military elements and different things that right. you might want in a movie like that, in a Sylvester Stallone film. Whereas E-40 is like the other extreme. E-40 is, uh, you know, it's, he's a rapper. He's a, probably one of the most famous rappers. And certainly he's got that street element. So, the it, you know, and it's a comedy. But it's a, yeah, it's so also it a comedy. To, it has to have music that's comical. Right. Not silly, but maybe even silly at times. But it has to be kind of in a cool way because E-40 is a cool rapper. He's right. not just a rapper. He's like one of the coolest, you know right. what I mean? That sort of thing. Well, but what I mean is it's not, and I don't mean this as a, um, to detract from the film mm-hmm. itself, but sometimes if you're a musician, mm-hmm. you think of the film as, again, not not to uh, downplay it, but you almost think in terms of a long form music video, mm-hmm. so that there is space for music. Mm-hmm. It, is it different when somebody thinks that way than when you're doing a film? The military elements or the or the physical. Uh, elements of a Rocky movie exist and that's you know it's very masculine and it's very Mm -hmm. you know like there's fanfare gladiatorial elements yeah Mm -hmm. but does it breathe differently because it was created from a musician sensibility absolutely it does and I think so I mean uh you know, E forty is a, you're right. He's a he's a drummer. A lot of people don't know. He, yeah, he played drums in band. When he was marching in school. band, baby. And I think it it influenced his rap style. And then then his um his father is a phenomenal blues guitarist. Uh-huh. A lot of people don't know that Earl Stevens Senior. Yep. And then his baby sister uh, Sugar T. She is a rapper and mm-hmm. very well known for that. But she's also a singer. And yeah. She has a great voice. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, you have to really kind of keep that in mind when you present them things anyway. Yep. So if I'm working on their movie, yeah, I got to make sure I'm dotting my I's and crossing my T's. They're going to be on that. Yep. And, you know, but let me let me just talk about this for a second. You know, uh, D-Shot, 
is very well known for being a rapper himself. Yep. And he's part of the crew, um, the Click family and all of that. But a lot of people don't know that he's a fantastic writer. And he is. But also he's a great filmmaker and self-taught. And, you know, I've known D shot since he was a kid and he was like, uh, he was, he was not, he was rough when he was a young guy. Yeah. And I know a lot of rough guys, but he was certainly one of the rougher. Never with me. He always enjoyed me. We were great. We got along great. Right. But other people that he didn't know. Yeah, he didn't want to step on to, his toe. He didn't want to step on his toe and not say, excuse me, it would be bad, you know, but he actually matured in a way that I'm really proud of him. He went on to really self-educate himself. He mm-hmm. actually went to film school and he learned how to. I didn't to, know that. Yeah. He put himself into a film school in, in uh, I think UCLA or something. Oh, wow. Or that's USC. That's, yeah, that's, he that's, went to USC. There's not a school. problem with that film he, school at all. He no, put no. himself into a class. They've and, done well. Yeah. Yeah. And then he put himself in there, man. And then came out and actually started to apply that to his filmmaking. And he knows a lot. A lot more than most people think. He did a phenomenal job directing if this If he film. went to either USC or UCLA film Film school. That's yeah. good enough. Yeah. Do you know that the U? Just as a sidebar, the USC Film School has had a participant in the um, category of uh, best picture mm. for the last something like eighty-two years. Mm-hmm. There's Incredible. been at least one USC graduate whose film wow. was nominated for best picture every single year. And if wow. he went to UCLA, guest lecturer Brad Pitt, right? It's uh, yeah. Professor James Franco. Yeah. You know? yeah. Wow. <laughs> Just they don't mess around, man. Either school, top, top, top yeah. notch. Yeah. But, it, you know, it's it's great, man. Some of these guys, I mean, you never know. But the I bar- was unaware that he had done that for himself. But, you know, it's not high. surprising. It's well, really I think I think what he knows, what Donnell knows, and what uh, E-40 knows, and many, many others, even Hammer and so many others, you know, the bar is high in the industry. And you have, if you're smart, you will continue to self-educate and make yourself better so that you can re- reinvent. Uh, Madonna has been phenomenal at that reinvention yeah. so that she could just carry on a career that long. I mean, she's a fantastic. And she, speaking of musicians, she's a musician. Sure. I don't know if you, a lot of people don't know she played drums as well mm-hmm. back in the day. She was, she was a drummer in a band before she went solo and came out. So... You know, it's it. The, the bar is high. We have to continue to innovate and reinvent, and uh, that's the best thing. I, you know, I do want to talk about that. I think my my best advice to people that are uh, up and coming is to uh, self educate and also try to come up with a new way to do things. Think about how the industry is going to be five years from now, 10 years from now. You know what I mean? Don't just be in the moment of today. Okay, let me, let me do what everybody else is doing right now. You have to think about what people are going to do later because five years is going to happen and 10 years is going to happen. And when it does, are you going to be behind or are you going to be ahead of everyone else? Sure. You know, so I think it's important to do. So again, you know, benefiting from mentoring and learning to listen and all of these things has certainly helped me. And I just hope that uh, everybody else will will take heed and, and pay attention to that. You know, um, you know, just just know that you have to be um, a leader and not just take a back seat in what you're doing. That, you that's know? a great segue to the question I've been trying to ask all night because I love this. Mm. So, OK, you two just came out. Put their album out. Hundred hundred million dollars guaranteed from Apple to the, distribute. The band YouTube. Yeah, the band okay. YouTube. Put okay. this new album out. And that to me is a is an innovative way to get their music back out to people. They haven't put an album out in five years. Mm-hmm. And uh, all these young kids, you know, five years, shoot, if you were seven years old, you know, you're twelve now, maybe you're buying your first album and you've never heard of U two. Mm. So um I think it's a genius way to get your album in front of well, five hundred million people, you know, uh, potentially. Every iTunes user. Every iTunes user, right. And then they're still going to release the album next month, you mm-hmm. know, on, on a regular kind of traditional media. What's out there? What, first off, what do you think of that? And also, whichever one you want to comment on, what's out there for the younger artists you know, who aren't you two, who can't command $100 million up front? It's hard to make $100 million on an album, you know? Yeah. So uh, what's out there? How does someone 
conquer the new challenges of the marketplace because you can't go out and sell 25 million records. Right. And I think that's once again what I was saying about reinvention. Um, trying to sell records today uh, is very different from how records were sold even only 20 years ago sure. and, and 40 years ago. And it's rapidly changing. The, right. in- the industry is, in fact, being turned on its head with um, MP3s sure. and CDs. Uh, you know, Essentially going away. Yeah, I was going to say uh, the, 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 the cassettes have gone away. Physical format in general. Vinyl records have, have pretty much disappeared. Um, and then um, CDs, yes, are now leaving and will be gone really soon. Yeah. I mean, there is a little bit of a resurgence in vinyl just from a nostalgia standpoint. But that's all it is. But that's all it is. It it's won't not, be the sales. It, yeah. But, I mean, most people don't even have space for it in their homes now. Yep. Most people don't own a turntable. Right. Um, no, it, but you can own the album you want instantly on your telephone. Yes. So why would you have space? Why would you even make space for it? That's Why would true. you even walk over to a turntable? Right. Yeah. When you can just push a button. Just on press your a phone. button and get yeah. in your car and take off and take your music wherever you go. And have it be digital, not you yeah. know, not a, a piece of metal dragging across a piece of vinyl. Right. You know? Which could be scratched or you know whatever or something like that. You have to go buy it again. So the mentality is different, and I think the smart person is going to look at all of that and think, okay, how can I market myself today? Uh, the first thing I think a person should do, a young person is learn to make good music in the first place. And I think um, all music is is great, or at least the inspiration of it probably starts from a great place. But you want to make music that's going to last, not a song that's so trendy that it only is here today and gone tomorrow. You want to make the kind of music, at least just make sure that you have quality control and that when when you play it, it sounds good. It feels good. It's a great song. Have it mixed properly by an engineer that really knows what they're doing instead of some, some guy that tells you that he knows what he's doing, but he doesn't. And um, so once you have a good product in the first place, and then that way, again, you just stand, you stand the chances of making sure that, again, 20 years from now, 10 years from now, your product still will be uh, relevant possibly or, or marketable. And so from there, you got to think about how you're going to get it out there. Um, it's really tough. You can't get the record deal that you would would have gotten 20 years ago just sure. based on the merit of your talent. Now it's about do you have a following already? Yeah. So I think uh, if you're uh, an artist trying to make it today, you need to um, think about how you're going to market it once it's done. You want to be able to, you know, I don't know if you're a musician or you're, a, you might be a rapper, whatever it is, make sure that you have some kind of performance that's decent so that people, when they see you, they go, whoa, that was really cool. And they're talking about it. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you're always going to be your own best calling card. When you go to perform, people will see you and be like, wow, man, that band was great. Or that guy or gal was great. And you want to be the thing they're talking about. And so once you get that going, you're creating a following locally or whatever for yourself. And what happens is the word of mouth gets around. And then the next thing you know, people want you to come do your show. People are buying your song and downloading it and telling their friends about it. And you become the talk of the town, if you sure. will. And from that, you create you can create a hype so that the record labels will hear about you and then want to sign you. They probably won't just sign you if you knock on their door. Once upon a time, you used to be able to knock on the door of a record label and somebody would come outside or they would invite you in because you were just it was like no big deal. The world was differently. They would have you in the office and you said you had a good song and you might not even have a record or whatever, a recording of it. You might just have an acoustic guitar. They would allow you to sit. You walked in with a guitar on your back, on your back. And you played it for them and they liked to hear. Or if you had a tape, it was was usually a horrible recording. But then there was somebody that would listen and go, you know what? I know that's horrible, but we'll record you and we'll make it right. I can hear what's in there. I can hear it. You know what I mean? I'm like, you and a, but today you better have a product like I said that's good and not even just the recording but have a performance that's good too because they're going to want to see it so the industry has changed the way that we receive music has changed the way that consumers spend money mm-hmm. uh, on an entertainer has changed but what has not changed is are the same things that you said w- were different about Hammer when he came to you mm-hmm. which were that he had a performance. 
he had a whole package that was different from everybody else's. It was, it was a plan. I mean, his first album was called Let's Get It Started. And he was, he, as much as you were instrumental in shaping the albums that, that, that uh, you know, came after that, he at least knew that this was the beginning of something and mm-hmm. that he wanted to grow into something. And mm-hmm. they had an idea of what it was he wanted to grow into. And that part of it has not changed. Right. Yeah, he created a sound that was so different. You and I both had the same experience. I'm like, I don't know what to make. And I, to me, it sounded like like the Fat Albert band. Like there were so many things being hit in the background. I'm like, I can't even make sense of this, but I had to reckon with it. Mm-hmm. I couldn't just dismiss it because there was something in it. And I had to like, I had to, listen to it and be immersed in it because it made you move mm-hmm. you know and that's not changed if you can do that you've got something so uh who do you see nowadays who make who makes you excited about music that that may be just coming out now probably my favorite artist currently and there's there's a few really really talented individuals. I'm not gonna lie. There's a lot that come out now, and I'm like, whoa, I like that. Well, there's uh, so much all, you have to sift through. All colors of the rainbow. I yeah. think there's so many people that are talented in so many genres. But sadly, we have so much to sift through. Right. There's there's almost too much. Before the industry was somewhat, it policed itself. Right. And there was a floodgate basically that was being monitored so that not too much would come through at a time. You know what I mean? Well, it's and funny. So it the- was the flip side of you could knock on the door of a record label mm-hmm. was that they would get talent and develop it. Mm-hmm. And you couldn't just have a record. Nowadays, yeah. you if you want to make a record, you can just make one. You can just make one at home and get it out there. That's yeah. true. And so now just about anybody could have a record. But but, but you're lacking the mentoring. Right. right. 30 lack- years ago, if you wanted yeah. to get a record, there was a process. And that, yeah. You're right. And that you're lacking the mentoring and you're also lacking the A&R process. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, Motown had a phenomenal A&R process right. where he had, uh, Barry Gordy had a, a, a plethora of producers under him after a while. And he would... They were all great, yeah. but still, a hit is a hit, and Mm -hmm. not every song is a hit. And so they would be in the studio working on these songs, and um, then once they were all done, they would have this big committee meeting at the end of the week, and he would listen to everybody's song. And all the people in this round table, if you will, would sit and listen, and um, if... uh, they heard a hit then they would support that if they didn't have a hit they would tell them you need to go back in or this is what you need to do and so we're lacking that today there's the just, power of no yeah you so need, some people get need to get told no sometimes sometimes yeah or go back and fix it you right. know this is okay but you know you can make it better and so what what we have today uh, to answer your question there's so many artists um and not everybody, in my opinion, is good. But there are a lot of talented uh, individuals out there. But one of the ones that really sticks out for me, and I and he's I, I call him new because he's newish, but he's only been around for a few years, even though he's been trying to get into the industry now for 15 years or more. But it would be Bruno Mars. I think he is my favorite. And the reason why I say it is because he's true to the art. He respects the music he's he's certainly of the new generation this whole new vibe of music Mm -hmm. he gets all of that and he is that yeah but at the same time he respects the old and he He brings just enough of that into what he's doing that he makes it cool but at the same time i think people our age and older really respect him as well um bruno mars is a multi-instrumentalist and he's a a fantastic singer and he's an entertainer uh, he gets on stage, he'll just pick up the microphone and wow you just with what he's singing. But then he might put the mic down or on the stand and then start stepping. He's doing choreography and all of these things. So for me, he's probably my favorite artist. And that's really who I'm paying attention to. And I've seen him on stage. And, you know, his father uh, is uh, an amazing percussionist. And he passed that down to Bruno, who is a fantastic drummer. And his and brother. And his brother plays drums in his band. His brother is his drummer, and his brother is a more than fantastic drummer. Yeah, his he's a monster. Is a monster. He's really probably one of the best drummers in the game today. Yep, wow. I will call him that. 
He, I mean, I, I saw Bruno live a few times, and I noticed the drummer looked like and him. And he's no joke on the drums himself, Bruno Mars. Well, I was saying, yeah, he's a, he's a drummer, and yeah. he he's a pianist, and he plays guitar and bass as well. I mean, he he's, probably he probably doesn't remember a time when he wasn't in front of a large crowd entertaining. Like right, it, all his life, really? so early, all yeah. his life, yeah, he was pretty much molded for it so i you know just being a fan of prince okay. i think i really like someone that's all around and so for me he's someone that stands out i i can't um i can't really just like say like taylor swift is the one for me right now you right. know she's a pretty girl but i don't know that she has really cut her teeth yet and made herself that seasoned musician that's really gonna uh, impress me but even though I impress her, I'm impressed by her success. I really am, and yeah. I pay attention to that. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I, my daughter took me to a um, Little Wayne concert, and I was blown away by how much they love him. You know, Little Wayne didn't blow me away, but the kids in the audience blew me away by how much they loved. I mean, they knew every one of the lyrics. The entire audience, the whole audience, huh. was singing all of the every verses. Lyric to his songs and the choruses just like from beginning to end they they knew every lyric i don't even see that in in like a michael jackson show people sing along but sometimes they stop right (laughs) in this show yeah i'm not you know what not coming up with the second verse to man in the mirror (laughs) yeah me neither i'm not doing it i might be crying by then i'm crying (laughs) (laughs) speaking to me so yeah, I'm just looking for that in the, these new artists. I'm looking to see what they're gonna do, but uh, yeah, my favorite would have to be Bruno Mars. So. Okay, I'm gonna have to give Bruno Mars a, a second look because he doesn't move me, but uh, but I I respect that, and I, especially your opinion matters to me too. And people like Taylor Swift are clearly talented, but for me, she's she's stuck in the pop era. You know, yeah, yeah. singing about boyfriends, singing about who she's mad at, and, and I need her to do something else to move mm-hmm. me. And I don't know what that thing is, but. Well, as she matures, she'll right. figure that's out what I need. That I need some maturity and, probably you know, in her craft. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm it's rooting for her. Yeah. Well, you I know. guess, you know what? Let me just say, and I'm not, I don't want to turn into an, uh, like I'm defending uh, Bruno, but let me just say on that note, I think I'm also impressed at his behind the scenes work. Uh-huh. Like he, a lot of people don't know that he co-wrote um, um, the Forget Me song or Forget You song by CeeLo. Yeah, by CeeLo. He yeah. co-wrote that. Okay. And um, he also co-wrote... Um, he co-wrote a lot of things. Over the last four or five years, yeah. he's been the co-writer on a, an awful a lot, lot of, of stuff. stuff. Yeah, like uh, the the You Spin Me Round song by right. um, Flo, Flo Rider. Right. He co-wrote that. And, you know, just a ton of hits. You're right. He's either written all of it or part of a lot of hits behind the scenes. So I, I respect Well, before that. he broke as a solo artist... He may that was his living, mm-hmm. you know. He was just writing for other people and, and a doing lot of well. People. Missy Elliott came up like that, um, and then Lady Gaga as well. She was a, a songwriter for a lot of people behind the scenes. She would write the songs and she would demo it, but you know, it would not be put out. And um, um, a- Avon, um, Akon, I should say. Uh, knew about her and I think he signed her as a writer and eventually he agreed to put her out as an artist because of that she couldn't get arrested by the labels and Akon took a chance on her well he did pretty well he did yeah. fantastically yeah. between uh, T-Pain and her sure yeah, yeah. great that, success what you're talking about too that collaboration that seems to be more of the modern way of, of, of getting through that A&R process mm-hmm. you bring your social network in and you collide it with whoever you know Pharrell's and that expands your music into that circle mm-hmm. and then you go do it again with somebody else and somebody else and you can mix genres it's fine yes, you know yes uh, Eminem will work with anybody who's got talent you yeah. know he doesn't care <laughs> and uh and then you get a boost from that and mm-hmm. that seems to be kind of from my angle that seems to be how the young artist has to try to do it is, is to understand how to create a crowd mm-hmm. get beyond your family and people still like your music then then you probably have a shot you know? there is an availability that there didn't used to be because i know that um well you james had listened to everybody i can throw out a name from you know any genre and your familiarity um is always there hmm. And that's the fun of music, but a lot of people didn't get that. I mean, back in in uh, the '60s and '70s, sure, you had a lot of songwriting teams, but you know, uh, you didn't see Ashford and Simpson and uh, Burt Bacharach and Hal David writing together. 
Right. You know, there were there were labels and genres. They had their stables and and they stuck to their own and they worked within their own circle. But you didn't Mm -hmm. see a collaboration that went across genre. Or if Eddie Van Halen's on Beat It, it's Beat It featuring Eddie Van Halen. Like he's. Yeah, he wasn't invited into the room to collaborate on the album. Right. It was just Come do this. Hey, this is Quincy. Right. Will you come down because we need this, and you nobody does Quincy. it better than you. They hang up the phone. <laughs> right. <laughs> There'll be a limo outside your house in about 15 right. minutes. We right. need you to come out now and play this part. Yeah, I mean, it's just a very different game today. But, uh, you know, um, you know, I think you're right. Collaboration is great. I like to, just go back to artists, I think, um, and I call him an artist, but he's a producer, phenomenal. Uh, Pharrell Williams, I think, impresses oh, me a lot. Yeah. Man. Uh, his uh, catalog uh, of songs is really, really vast. Have you watched point. his show on the internet? No, I haven't. Oh, oh his too. show is terrific. Man. Really? It's, it's called so Artist good. Talk. You, really? You know, As a producer and everything, you need to watch the one between him and Daniel Lanois mm. and how they both come at things totally different. And mm. yet they're both nod their head going, yeah, I need some of that. Like they like are feeding off each other and it's just fantastic. Yeah, it really is. It's excellent. Wow. I, I want to check it out. What uh, network? Uh, not that we're trying to do a commercial for that, but what network? Well, we, we'll talk about that off the air because yeah. our listeners can Google that. But um, <laughs> so uh, we've been uh, we've been at it for well over an hour. Yeah, that's true. And and I really don't know what there's I can't think of anything I want to edit out. <laughs> so here's what I would like to do. I would like to close on that note. Uh, oh, actually, I have one more question, then we'll close on that. But um, but uh, can we do a part two of this? Man, please. Yeah. Oh, man, anytime. Okay. You know, anytime. You guys are family. So We're, we're uh, going gonna, gonna to hold you to that, and I really <laughs> appreciate uh, you being our inaugural guest, man. No, and no, killing I, it. I, I and love killing it. it. The bar is way high. Killing yeah, it. No, I love it. I love it. You guys are a great show, and uh, you've always had a great show, but I Thanks. think this uh, new page, this new chapter is fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so here's the final question. Uh, given the cross-genre possibilities, if there was a guy that you could work with uh, on a song in a completely different genre than you have come up in, which is really a lot of you know, anything between hip hop and funk and R and B. But if you could reach across, uh, whatever imaginary aisle exists and grab somebody else and say, Hey, let's do something together. Who would it be? Uh, you know, it's funny. A question like that, I could give you 20 or 50 names, but probably how about just a couple of, uh, the ones that okay. come to your head? Honestly, mostly. I'm really, uh, it, it would first be sting. I think he's probably my favorite artist ever. Wow. Because of just the fact that he's an artist, but he's a songwriter. He's written pretty much every song that you've heard him sing. Yeah. He's, you know, uh, almost to a song, he's written it. and But yet, he's this phenomenal musician and just probably one of the best to ever do it, yep. ever. I ever. Mean, he, yeah. 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 There's no dissent here. We love, we love Sting. Yep. Police music yeah. has, he, doesn't even have right. legs. It's got wheels. Yeah. He's never going to yeah. stop. Yep. But someone that he's connected with as well, they were produced by the same producer for a time. And that would be uh, Phil Collins, though. I would love to work with Phil Collins. I think he's, again, he just, he is drums. He's not a drummer. I think he and drums are one and the same. Wow. And he's one of the best drummers ever ever on the planet and and also a phenomenal singer songwriter and i would love to work with him I'm yeah he really can write it too <laughs> he can <laughs> sing it right who's it. the common producer between the two of them uh, hugh, hugh padgham hugh, hugh padgham yeah is mm-hmm. how yeah hugh padgham uh produced uh, genesis right and uh the police at the same time huh. he was working on that all of their phenomenal of stuff yeah and uh, yeah, so I mean, these like the popular Genesis, not the yeah. uh, not the music nerd Genesis, but yeah. the popular Genesis. But then and Phil Collins, the time, yeah, Phil Collins later borrowed him, and then you know he produced a lot of stuff with Phil Collins as yeah. well, the solo stuff that he was doing, was all excellent. But he, yeah. and he really reshaped the Police because he stepped in to do Ghost in the Machine, yes, yeah. which was a huge turning point. He's a producer engineer. Yeah. And so he's somebody I would really enjoy working with as well. Uh, but um, yeah, as far as artists, 
Man, there's so many. So we got Sting. We got uh, Phil, Phil Collins. Collins. Boy, that's uh, yeah, you just, yeah, yeah. that's rarefied yeah. air. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's just so many. I think there's so many really, really talented musicians. And I'm a student of music. I listen, as you said, I do pay attention to all sure. genres of music, not just one. My mother had me listening as a child to everything, all the folk stuff that was coming out. Uh, you know, my mother. Yeah, I can't take you by surprise with anything, man. Yeah, my I, mother and father really. I could, we call them closet hippies. You didn't, you didn't know by looking at them, but if you're around my parents, you would see that they're, I call them closet hippies. And so we got to listen to everything blues, sure. folk, all the rock stuff, country as well, and then funk stuff. I grew up listening to that, the dance music, so I, I love it all. Sure, There's just so many that I would love to work with. And uh, Quincy Jones is someone that I, I would just want to be around him. You know just to I mean? witness his process. Just to sit next to him in the studio. I, you know what? I lost a Grammy to Quincy Jones. And I <laughs> swear right. not so bad. That's I swear right. I'm honored by that though. That's, but that's you like, know, man, I was dancing with this girl and I knew I yeah. had her, and then Brad Pitt walked yeah. in. Yeah. It's all right. Doggone it. It's all right. <laughs> what are you gonna do? It's, what are you gonna do? Just walk <laughs> away and <laughs> let it happen, you know. But it was. We we got nominated and um producer of the year, you know, James Early, Felton Pilot. Quincy Jones and like two other people, and of course Quincy took it. Yeah, but you know it's Quincy. What do you do? He's wow. got like eighty wow. of them things. Yeah, oh he's yeah. got. We remember we were talking about. We the did. Other day? We looked at uh, stats about Quincy Jones, and and it was just staggering. Like there's the number, no way he's got them displayed. The yeah. number of there's Grammys so that he had, it was yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. but uh, you're right. That's not that's not so bad. You it's, know, and when you get the uh, you get the nod. And people say it's it's just an honor to be nominated. Mm -hmm. That's true, isn't it? Oh, yes. Especially when your company is Qu Quincy Jones. Like yeah. this year, this piece of work that I produced mm -hmm. is up there being looked at as being as good as what Quincy produced. And that year, what did Quincy produce? Uh, I think it was his um, Secret Garden album. Okay. That's what it was. You yeah. lost yeah. Grammy to Quincy Jones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean... It's nice to be nominated. But, of course, my music, you know, Hammer has won a lot of Grammys with my music. Yeah. So, in yeah. that way, I'm a Grammy winner anyway. So, right. it's, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. A lot of awards, actually, uh, yeah. have been won. But, I mean, it's great. And I'm, uh, I continue to be a student of this industry. So, that's the reason why I would love to just be with so many and learn from them. And, you know, try to help others as well. Oh, well, fantastic. Right. Well, we'll do a part two. Oh, I want to do part seven. Yeah, man, really. <laughs> yeah, you're all, you're always on. invited. To always, come in. yeah. You're just always invited to, you know, come and eat or whatever. Well, next time, next time I'll come back and interview you guys. I'll all say. right, yeah, <laughs> shoot, yeah, hell sure. yeah, it'll be my turn. Anytime, anytime. Ladies and gentlemen, our privilege to have the great James Early. Thank you, James. I love you, man. Love you guys. Thank yeah, you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. I can't wipe the smile off my face. Man. <laughs>